This is by far the spookiest experience my family and I have ever had regarding the paranormal. I'm currently living in Australia, and this all started when I moved into my current house around three years ago. In my culture, we believe that whenever a family moves into a new home, a priest should come to perform various prayers to bless the house. However, when my mom bought the house, we immediately went on holiday for three months, so we were unable to perform the rituals. Everything started when we first came back to our house. Just some background, my mom raised me on her own, so it was just the two of us staying in the house at the time. I was still in high school and my mom worked in the city, so we both took the train every morning. My mom always left home earlier than I did, so it was my job to lock up every morning. My mom worked late almost every day, so I would get home first and be home alone for at least five hours every day. One morning as I left home, I began to feel paranoid that I had not locked the door, so I went back to check it. The door was locked. Later that day when I came home from school, I walked up my driveway to find that the door was standing wide open. I freaked out, but because I was brave enough, I went inside. Our kitchen is pretty close to the entrance, so I grabbed a knife and searched the entire house. There was no one there. I decided not to tell my mom because she was already really stressed with work, and I didn't want her to freak out. Over the next few days, other strange things started happening. For one, our garage door would randomly start opening whenever we were home. My mom was kind of scared, but then we thought maybe our neighbor's garage remote functioned at the same frequency or something, and it was activating our door too, so we dismissed it. It had been about two months since we were living in our new house, and everything seemed to be normal again. Until one day, when I was awoken in the middle of the night by my mom. She looked super scared and asked me if I had come to her room to wake her up. I said no, I was half asleep and I had no idea what she was rambling on about. She didn't believe me and made me swear that I hadn't. I always play scare pranks on my family so I can kind of see why. I swore I didn't and I asked her what was going on. My mom is a super light sleeper, and so while she was sleeping, she heard somebody prop her door open. She looked up and saw the figure of a boy and thought it was me. So she asked it what was wrong and blinked, and there was nothing there, but her door was still open. She called my name a few times, and there was no response, hence why she came into my room. I have to admit, given the stuff happening with the doors, I was kind of scared but I convinced my mom that she was imagining things and she went back to sleep. Ever since that night up to this very day, my mom still sleeps with her door open and the living room light on. And I don't blame her, especially after what happened next. Two weeks after this incident occurred, my mom's best friend and her son and daughter, they were both around my age, came over from our homeland, Malaysia, to visit us. I was really excited, as I've always been close to them. One thing you should know about my aunt, she's had many experiences growing up with the paranormal, so she's super scared of ghosts. For this reason, her kids and I always used to play pranks on her. One day, the four of us were playing poker on the dining table while my mom was taking a nap in the living room. Suddenly, my mom rushes out of the living room, her eyes wide open, and she looked really scared. She asked who had woken her up from her nap. The four of us were completely dumbfounded as we'd been playing cards the entire time. She then told us that she felt someone tap her shoulder while she was asleep. When she opened her eyes, there were two feet on the floor, but when she blinked, the feet were gone and nobody was there. My mom was full on freaking out now, especially after what had happened the other night. Then my aunt, given how afraid she is of ghosts, started to freak out too. I didn't want her holiday to be ruined, so I managed to convince them that my mom was probably in the middle of a dream when she woke up, and she was probably just hallucinating. I know it sounds stupid, but hey, it worked. But then the next day, something else happened. 
My mom had gone to the shops to get groceries. The kids and I were playing video games in the living room while their mom was having a shower. Suddenly we heard the bathroom door burst open and out runs my aunt wrapped in her towel. She screamed at us, telling us to stop trying to scare her and that it wasn't funny. The three of us were super confused and her daughter asked her what had happened. She told us that she knew that we were the ones knocking on the bathroom door, even after she told us to stop three times. I know it probably seems like she was overreacting, but I cannot emphasize how afraid of ghosts she is. I exchanged a concerned look with her kids and then told her that it genuinely was not us and that we'd been playing video games the entire time. Soon my mom got home and we told her what happened. Let's just say that my aunt started sleeping with her room lights on for the rest of the trip. Soon my aunt and her kids had gone home and it was back to me and my mom again. We were back to our regular routine. My mom was finally at peace and she hadn't seen anything for a while, apart from the same thing with the garage door every once in a while. The same, however, could not be said for me. It seemed that it had come to be my turn to be tormented. As I mentioned before with my mom at work, I would be home alone for a few hours every day. I began to start hearing things. The strange thing is, it would never occur while I was in the living room. Whenever I went to use the toilet or went to sit in my room, I would start hearing things coming from the living room and kitchen. It started out small, just the sound of some panting, like if you'd just run a long distance. But the minute that I entered the living room, nothing. There would be no sound at all. It soon started to get worse. I would hear footsteps pacing around outside my room, and spoons and pots falling in the kitchen. But every time that I stepped out into the living room, the noises would stop and everything would be just as I had left it. There was even a time when I thought I heard a kid laughing right outside the door when I was using the toilet. I decided not to tell my mom yet because she seemed to be getting over her experiences and I didn't want to scare her again. But one day I felt that I needed to tell her and we decided that that day it was time we contacted our priest to perform the prayers for our house. It was the day that my best friend and his parents came over for dinner. It all started as an innocent dinner. My best friend and his family were Malaysian too, and we were having a great time talking about home while having a signature Malaysian meal. My friend's dad was telling us a story when all of a sudden his face just froze and his eyes widened. He honestly looked like he was having a stroke. His face contorted into a frown and he just stared down at the table. My mom and I shared a worrying look, but my friend and his mom just continued eating like nothing was happening. Suddenly his dad seemed to return to us and he continues telling the story as if nothing just happened. He could see though that my mom and I looked worried. Suddenly, his wife tapped him on the shoulder and said, Just tell them. He frowned at his wife and just kept eating. There was an awkward silence for a few minutes, and then he finally decided to address the elephant in the room. He apologized for scaring us and assured us that there was no need to worry. He then went on to tell us about his life. Since he was a child, he'd been very religious, and from a young age, he felt a very close connection to God. He regularly meditated and was very spiritual. He was so spiritual that when he came into his mid-twenties, he had awoken a gift. He was able to see dead people. I kid you not. When he said this, I immediately looked at my friend, waiting for him to start laughing at some prank. But my friend's face was dead serious, and he continued looking at his dad as he told the story. He told us that he could see them everywhere. When he was walking his dog on the street, when he was sitting in the park, in people's houses, and even sometimes sitting on people who had been possessed. He said the spirits were drawn to him because they knew he could see them, and they would stalk him, begging him to help them reach the afterlife. He said there was simply nothing he could do, because these people had died before their time, and that they would simply have to wait on Earth until it was their time. Back home, he was regularly contacted by people having paranormal experiences to perform a cleansing to drive evil spirits away. 
He told us about some of those experiences, but I don't feel like it's my place to share them here. He then asked us something that gave me chills. Have you guys performed the prayers for your house yet? My mom refused to answer the question until he told her why he had asked it. He said that he didn't want to worry us and that if we hadn't, we probably should. My mom continued to ask him why until he finally conceded, and this is what he said. Remember when I had that moment just now while I was talking? I had a visit. I won't tell you what it was, but it was the same spirit I saw standing at the front door when we came here. That's when my mom told him everything that had been happening. It's during this time that I decided to tell my mom about the things that I'd been hearing in the house. My friend's dad then told us that he didn't think it was a malicious spirit, but to be safe it was time for us to conduct the prayers for the house. Before he left, he asked my mom if he could see our altar in the prayer room. My mom took him, and we all followed him. As he stood in front of the altar, his body suddenly shook, as if he had just had a huge hiccup or something. He then put his hands together and bowed his head. Before leaving, he said, I can see why the two of you have not been hurt. You are both protected. And that concluded their visit. A week later, we arranged for a priest from our local temple to cleanse and bless our home. I promise you that since that day, nothing strange has ever happened in our house. Even the garage door has stopped opening on its own. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I've learned my lesson. I will never move into a new house without performing the rituals that my culture demands. I went to Sydney, Australia and tried the ghost tour at Q Station. Weird things happened there. Despite having a comfortable flight from Manila to Sydney, I still felt tired. After passing through immigration, I immediately went to the arrival hall, loaded my Opal card, and rode a train to my mate's flat in Burwood. It was raining when I arrived in Sydney. At only 18 degrees, the warm shower and the bed were the only two things that I looked forward to. It was still raining when I woke up. The overcast weather made the day bleak and gloomy. Then, I just remembered the things I watched online a few days ago, and one of them was the ghost tours in Sydney. I asked my mate about it, and the next thing I knew, he already booked us an extreme ghost tour on a weekend after my trip to Melbourne. Sydney was not a glamorous city back in the 19th century. Diseases such as smallpox, Spanish influenza, and bubonic plague were prevalent. To mitigate the spread of these infectious diseases, all ships entering Sydney Harbor must be checked by the doctors. Even if there was only one sick passenger on board, everybody was required to stay at the quarantine station for 40 days. Those who were sick were brought to the hospital for treatment. At least 16,000 people were brought here from the 1830s to 1984. 570 people died here. Today, Q Station serves as a hotel, a conference center, and a part of Sydney Harbour National Park. Our extreme ghost tour was scheduled at around 9 p.m. To beat the weekend traffic of North Sydney, we left Burwood at around 6 p.m. and drove all the way to Manly. We had our dinner there before heading to Q Station, located east of Manly Beach. We arrived at half past eight, way too early for the tour. So we went straight to the front desk and toured around. Some of the original relics like tombstones, luggage, and clothing are still there. It felt eerie upon seeing those personal belongings that once belonged to people who got quarantined here more than a hundred years ago. Disclaimer. We met up with the group at half past nine. Our guide, Bob, told us that we should not rationalize everything we would encounter during the tour. Jace and I are both air traffic controllers, and in our line of work, we rationalize everything. This time, we would have to leave everything behind and open up our senses. 
We were given EMF, or electromagnetic field, sensors. This instrument detects an anomaly of the surrounding electromagnetic field. Experts believe that ghosts manifest themselves as a form of energy. First stop, the chamber. The tour started inside the chamber. There are two rooms. Both aren't that big, with a floor area approximately 50 square meters. We were locked inside for at least five minutes, just to observe everything. I didn't feel anything in the first room, except that it faintly smelled of hay. I didn't mind it, because I thought it used to be a barn. But in the second room, I felt something. The surrounding air felt heavy, and I felt an unknown force pressing on my cheeks. It was quite difficult to breathe at some points. As we went out, Bob told us that it used to be a gas chamber. About 40 people were locked inside for sanitary reasons. Now, it all made sense as to why it felt so heavy inside, and why I felt claustrophobic inside the second room. The second stop was the hospital. It was quite a long hike to the quarantine hospital. During the early days, it was harder to get to the hospital. You would need to climb the steep walkways. Basically, when you're on top, you're completely isolated. The hospital is located near the cliff overlooking Sydney Harbor. There are several buildings around, including the quarters of the nurses and doctors. Hospitals, no matter how modern their facilities are, can get creepy at night. But this one was way creepier than I thought. We first entered the doctor's quarters. It was dark, but cold inside the room, and there were three bunk beds inside. As I sat and leaned on the lower bunk bed while listening to Bob's stories, I felt something was pinching my lower back. I shrieked, and Bob caught my attention. I told Bob that it was nothing. I lied. We went into the main hospital room. It was quite big, and there were six beds. Feeling brave, I lied down on one bed and tried to make some connections. I don't know how, but I just closed my eyes momentarily. I felt nothing, and honestly, the bed felt soft and comfortable. I transferred to an adjacent bed near the wall, and the moment that I lied down, it felt weird. It felt like something was pushing me, but not in a forcible manner. The room is connected to another room that had a darker history. Bob told us to open the door and asked if we felt something different. Everyone told him that it was colder in that room, despite the doors and windows being tightly shut. Some of our EMF detectors went crazy. According to Bob, there are four resident ghosts inside this room. Two children who love to play hide and seek inside the cupboard. A woman and the malevolent spirit of an old man. There were stories circulating around that one group who stayed overnight in the hospital decided to record themselves singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and they caught something on the recording. They heard children giggling, a woman saying, Wait, wait, and an angry voice of a male shouting, Get out. Jace had his EMF detector pointed near the cupboard, it went crazy. So what he did, he got his phone and started recording himself singing the same song. Actually, we were all at the center of the room, and we didn't hear him singing. After we went out, we played back his recording. Believe it or not, he caught something on his recording. There weren't disembodied voices from children or from the women, but in the middle of his singing, Someone was shouting in the background, F you, your singing stinks. Things got real. The third stop is the Gravedigger's House. The Gravedigger's House is one of the most haunted parts of the complex. It's so haunted that Bob won't dig deeper into its bloody history. It used to be the house of, of course, the Gravedigger and a doctor. Just a few steps from the house is the third class cabin. During that time, there were reports of missing girls and children. 
eyewitness reports claimed that they saw some kids and girls entering the grave digger's house. More so, the doctor was attached to the girls, especially the young ones. The house is a bungalow. It has two bedrooms with a small living room, dining room, and the kitchen and the bathroom are located at the back part. Bob left us in the house for at least 10 minutes. The first room to the right used to be the bedroom of the doctor. As I slowly entered the room, the atmosphere drastically changed. It felt cold and sad at the same time. I don't know, I just couldn't help but be sad in that room. I went out right away because I couldn't take the sadness any longer. The second room was rather weird. I was about to enter there, but something felt wrong. It felt like there was a force barring me from entering. Some of my groupmates checked their EMF and it went a bit crazy. I guess everybody was not welcome to come inside. The back portion, where the kitchen and the bathroom are located, was the scariest part of the house. It was dark, but that part of the house was faintly illuminated by the moon outside. I stayed there for at least three minutes, just to observe. I suddenly felt goosebumps all over my body. As I neared the bathroom, it felt sinister. I didn't go inside because my instincts told me not to. I managed to take photos inside the house. My phone didn't catch anything paranormal, but all the photos are super creepy. When everybody is outside, Bob confessed that the bathroom was the most haunted part of the house. Locals claimed that a girl was brutally murdered inside the bathroom and that she got strangled by barbed wire. Fourth stop was the morgue. Firstly, I never like going to a morgue, especially if it's dark and abandoned. I was very nervous the moment that we entered the morgue. To add to the scare factor, they had a mannequin lying at the center, covered with a white cloth. I know it's staged, but it still creeps the hell out of me. While Bob was talking about history, it started to get cold, but weirdly only on my right side. No one was standing to my right. There was nothing there but a door that led to the laboratory. A cold breeze passed through the door. I wasn't paying attention to Bob's story because I felt like somebody was standing beside me. I whispered to Jace about it, so he scanned his EMF, and suddenly there was a spike of energy. He told me to calm down, but I was so close to breaking down. As minutes went by, I started to feel goosebumps on my right arm, and I could feel that somebody was actually touching my arm. It was like a gentle caress, but definitely not human. I became uneasy after we went out of the morgue, and Bob noticed. He smiled and said, The resident ghost liked you, didn't he? Really, Bob? The fifth stop was the shower block. The shower block is the most haunted place in the whole Q station. During that time, those who were sick had to take a shower of carbonic acid, not water, at the shower block. The acid killed fleas and ticks in seconds. Two days after, your skin starts to peel off. It was dark and eerie as we entered the shower block. The stench was still there and I felt lightheaded. The same feeling when you just got out of a boat ride. Bob told us that there are shadows lurking around the dark corners of the shower block. For 15 minutes, we were instructed to roam around and observe. He told us to go to the corner where we felt the most uncomfortable. I had goosebumps as we passed by the center aisle and turned right, since we both felt uneasy on this side. As we were walking back to the center aisle, I felt that somebody was watching us from behind. So instinctively, we turned our heads slowly, and there we saw a dark figure peering from the corner of the block. I am pretty much sure that my mind was not playing tricks on me. The figure was tall, about seven feet, and it was darker than the dark. All of a sudden, it came right after us. I don't know what happened next, but Jace and I were back at the main door of the block in a jiffy. Whatever that thing was, it scared the crap out of me. The tour lasted for three hours. It was already 12.30 a.m. when we went back to the parking lot safe and sound. 
I honestly don't know what to feel after the tour. I was physically and mentally exhausted. Nonetheless, it was a great experience. It finally validated that I am sensitive to the paranormal. I do believe in ghosts, and I don't easily get scared by them. But my experience at Q Station was overwhelming. A lot can happen in three hours. I want to share a few things that have happened to me since moving to the land down under. I moved to Australia in 2018, built a home with my partner in far north Queensland. The area where we built is part of the Daintree Rainforest. We are surrounded by rainforest and the Coral Sea is about 50 meters through the dense bush. Things were relatively quiet until about five weeks ago. Now, we are seeing Min Min lights, or spook lights. Little balls of light that are far too big and bright to be glow bugs, moving through the trees and about the property. We hear booms and bangs against the outside walls of our newly built home. We grab a flashlight and go out to see what's going on. The noise is so loud that if it had been a bird or a bat, the poor thing would have broken a neck or at least stunned itself. The property is fenced in, gated, and locked. There are no rocks or clouds of dirt on the concrete, nothing on the sides of our house as if kids were pulling a prank. It literally sounded like hands banging against the walls. We get up to go see, then come back in, get back in bed, and it happens again. It's like it's toying with us, being mischievous, the locals and aboriginals have told me about Yowie, which is similar to the United States version of Bigfoot. They've also told me about Bunyip and other dreamtime creatures that reside in and make the Dane Tree their home. It is one of the oldest rainforests on the planet. We are surrounded by the beauty of nature, and now it's like every night is a new adventure. We don't know what might happen next. Nothing happens inside the home just on the property. I've done research online and at the local library. Can't find anything other than the occasional Yowie sighting. I've gotten in touch with a few ghost hunting teams and asked my questions. I'm waiting for a response to see if they might know anything. My partner's sister said that we may have built our home on a gravesite, but I doubt this. Not everything is built on a gravesite. It may just be the land itself. I know the Dane Tree is very special to the Aboriginal. It's sacred, in fact. Why is it that when things like this happen, I never have my cell phone in hand? It's like I'm so caught up in the moment, all I can do is experience it. But I'm going to try to capture something on film. I'd really like to know what's going on. In Ivory Coast, West Africa, my friends and I walked into the biggest hotel and palace in the capital at 3 p.m. And it was completely empty and silent. There were no cars, no taxis outside, no customers, no employees. This hotel is an enormous complex with a mall, dozens of shopping stores, pools, tennis courts, restaurants, conference rooms, it's always busy, 24-7. I needed to withdraw money from the ATM, and all the doors were open, so I walked inside. It was the eeriest experience of my entire life. It was like the place had been abandoned. But why the open doors? And everything was okay. It was clean. Just all the people were missing. There were no lights on, just the emergency lights. But since all the doors were open, the natural light was shining through. So at least it wasn't too dark. 
The only noise came from my steps on the marble, and there wasn't even an echo. My heart was pounding in my chest because the situation just didn't make any sense. At one point, I saw some light on in a store about 50 meters away from me with people inside, and I breathed a sigh of relief. But once I arrived in front of the store, I noticed that I couldn't really distinguish the shapes or the faces of the people, even though it was clear glass. They were fuzzy, for lack of a better word. Panic started to kick in, but I still needed that money, so I hurried to the ATM that was closest. I was afraid the ATM would be dead, but surprisingly, it was functional. I withdrew the money and ran out of the hotel using the first exit I found. Still, no one in sight. After walking a few meters, I exited on another street, and suddenly everything got noisy again. It was full of people and activity. I came back later to the hotel on another day, and it was totally back to normal. It's been almost 20 years since this happened, but I will never forget this experience. I still think about it from time to time, and every time I return and I walk past it, it still makes me feel weird. A couple of years ago, I went on a study abroad trip with my university to Australia for a couple of months. We started in Darwin and traveled south. The bus ride itself was pretty uneventful, except for my friend and I being accidentally left at Devil's Marble for a few hours, but that's another story. We stayed at a hostel in Alice Springs and got up before dawn to drive to Uluru. The rest of the students had decided to go back to sleep for the bus ride, but I was looking out the window at what little I could make of the scenery. It was that time right before dawn when you're first able to make out your surroundings. The bus slowed down to park and made a turn into an empty lot, and that's when I saw it. An extremely large shadow walking through the bush. I'm a bad judge of height, but it was taller than any human I've ever seen, perhaps ten feet tall, with extremely elongated arms and legs. Even though there was enough light to make out the details of the landscape, the figure appeared completely, well, void of detail. Like it was smooth, black, and featureless. The black was a stark contrast to the rest of the scenery, as there was a thin mist in the area. I've seen flashes of shadows driving before, or something out of the corner of my eye, but this was different. I was able to watch it for several slow seconds as it walked in this odd, swaying, dipping motion with a distinct grace, moving effortlessly across the bush. I felt like as soon as I saw it, I had been electrocuted. Every hair was standing on end, and my skin was prickling. I tried to wake my friend, but by the time she looked out the window, it was gone. I'm sure this could be explained away by possible sleep deprivation or just seeing shadows, but I personally believe that what I saw was real. If anyone has any local legends about the area, I would love to hear them. I wanted to share an experience that still freaks me out just thinking about it. Just down the road from where I used to live a few years ago in southeast Australia is the opening into about a hundred acres of woodland and bush. I frequently went in there when I was younger to do the usual things, riding and camping, etc. I was out driving at about 11.30 p.m. with my girlfriend, and as we were in the area, I decided to show her the woodlands while we were there. She loves everything to do with nature, and it was summer, so it was extremely warm. 
I left my car with the lights shining into the trees as we weren't going in too far and it was pitch black inside. The two of us just sat, having a smoke, chatting, and generally relaxing. She was sitting on a sort of map of the area that had been put in some plastic, and I was keeping an eye on the trees as I had a feeling that something was just wrong. I've read stories before about people who felt like they were in danger, even though nothing around them was perceptibly off, and this was that same feeling. Every sense was almost reaching out, and my adrenaline was up, but there wasn't really anything in my eye line that seemed any different. After lighting another cigarette to calm my nerves, I scanned the tree line again and realized that it looked different from before. It was only after staring into the darkness that I saw that there was moonlight, which was now lighting up grass. Before, it couldn't reach the grass, and it dawned on me that that was because there was a black shape blocking it. I assumed it was a tree. The only way that I can describe it was that all sound just ceased, and everything went dead silent. A few seconds later, this disgusting feeling of dread fell over me, and I saw motion in the dark of the path as this thing crawled toward us on all fours. I've seen nearly every animal in the outback here, and we don't have any large predators like in the United States or Europe, but somehow I knew this thing was a predator, and it wasn't hiding itself from us, just slowly crawling toward us. I don't know if my girlfriend saw it or not, as I couldn't look away, but just as it reached the line that my car lights were able to illuminate, it reared up onto two legs and just sat, staring at us. I'm 6'4", and this thing was about another meter taller than me, with arms that were far too long, that reached down near the ground. All I could make out was an off-white, almost yellowish fur on it, and in the dim light, could make out the silhouette of its head as being that of a dog or a wolf. I wasn't able to move as it stared at me, but it was at this point that my girlfriend gasped which seemed to break me out of whatever was stopping me from thinking logically. I grabbed her by the arm and we sprinted to the car, slammed the doors and tore out of there as fast as I could. Both of us were too scared to speak until about a half an hour later. We've both discussed it many times, and the feeling that we had was what I imagine a rabbit sees when it catches a wolf or a fox looking at it that this is something that would be able to end us with absolute ease if it chose to. Neither of us have ever been able to come up with any explanation for what it was, but it has definitely changed the way I view the woods and bush when I go camping or hiking now. Every time I go out, I think back to that day, and I wonder what it was, and if I'll ever see it again. My childhood was spent in the frosty realm of the Arctic. In my hometown, if the night was clear, it was ordinary to witness a variety of peculiar lights dancing across the sky. The Arctic winters are long, affording us more time to admire the starlit expanse. It's a breathtaking spectacle, provided you can endure the biting chill. I often ventured a few kilometers outside the town on a snowmobile, powered it down, and laid on the snow, enveloped by the tranquility, the only interruption being the occasional whispering breeze. The northern lights, or aurora borealis, were also a frequent sight. Not a daily event, but they occurred often enough to become a part of our lives, unless they put up an exceptionally grand show. One particular night, I decided, without seeking my parents' permission, to take their snowmobile for one of my midnight jaunts. I navigated a few kilometers beyond the town, over the hills, seeking a spot untouched by the town's light pollution. Upon reaching the spot, I switched off the snowmobile and nestled into a comfortable position to gaze at the sky and reflect on life. The view was rather ordinary, 
satellites gliding across, an uninspiring display of magnetic field disturbances, and so on. That's when an odd clicking sound started to manifest. My initial assumption was that it was the snowmobile's engine cooling down, which in the cold contracts and expands quite a bit. However, the sound wasn't emanating from that direction. I then speculated it could be a nearby wild animal, which meant that I had to leave promptly. But the rhythmic nature of the clicking was too regular for any animal to make. The noise seemed mechanical, and more perplexingly, it was coming from above. Naturally, I looked up to identify the source. The scene was familiar. Stars, northern lights, a languid satellite, all ordinary. But before I could disregard it and return home, I noticed something unusual in the Aurora Borealis. There were three distinct points of light, growing increasingly brighter. Initially, I dismissed them as unusually symmetrical stars, but I was mistaken. The clicking sound in my head amplified from a soft pen tapping to the clattering of billiard balls. Then, it all ceased. The lights vanished, the clicking subsided, and except for being somewhat frozen and petrified, I was unharmed. I hopped back onto the snowmobile, wondering if I was losing my mind. It took longer than usual to start the machine, which raised my anxiety, but soon I was en route back to town. Various plausible explanations for the incident raced through my mind. A helicopter from the mine, peculiar behavior of the northern lights and such. I reached home to find it dark. This was odd since it wasn't that late when I departed. I quietly entered the house, shed my winter gear, and found the house eerily silent. With my parents being teachers, they were typically up late, grading papers or watching TV. My goal was to slip into bed unnoticed, which, to my relief, I managed to do easily. I was setting my alarm for the next day, when the reality of the situation hit me. The sluggish engine, the cold stiffness, the empty house during what felt like a brief ride. When I departed, it was nearing 11 o'clock p.m., but now I saw that it was almost six in the morning. I had been entranced by clicking lights for nearly seven hours. I didn't sleep that night, and I no longer embark on late night snowmobile expeditions. So this is a true story that happened to me, which I'm weary to share, as there have been many times where I've opened up only to be met with ridicule. But I hope you take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off of Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there, and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings. Bryce, the residence hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two, I'll share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was me, my girlfriend, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with an anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, and then a quick right, and you were in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand, and my camera in the right, scanning, trying to catch something. 
On the left at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and light, thought I saw it again and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white, illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of just two frames, she's behind the door halfway, and in the next frame, she's gone. My heart felt like ice water had run through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger one, maybe ten, hair parted in the middle, an unusually large forehead, and was deformed in some way. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. This is where it gets even weirder, though. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that windows grow back, and if you do any damage to them, spirits will follow you home. I broke a window on accident. I was laying in bed one night at about 3 to 4 a.m. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was, and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing, tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless, as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of maybe 20 seconds. Once it covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. I cringed tightly, and for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped, and the whole incident left me on the verge of tears. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to legend, it makes sense. My friend and I camped on his property in the middle of nowhere. It was in the area of Cane Creek, Kentucky, near Laurel Lake. There was no service, no noise, no anything but you and the woods. We set up our tent under an overhang, and I was tasked with gathering the firewood. It was about 5 p.m. or so, and while collecting, I got this odd feeling. And then I started to hear whispers. They weren't saying anything I could make out. It was just murmurings. At that point, I got this creepy, odd feeling, and I moved closer to our camp to collect the firewood. I didn't want to stray very far after that. Night progresses and nothing out of the ordinary happens, until we climb into our sleeping bags. I heard footsteps in the leaves and more murmuring. I was getting really freaked out, but I know the best thing to do is to ignore it and sleep, and so I did. The following morning, my friend and I found ourselves awake at 5 a.m. He asked me if I had heard whispering last night. I told him I heard it twice, and we were both just as baffled as the other. We were not the first people to camp in this area. His uncle and his friends attempted to camp there as well, but they couldn't make it through the night either. My dad is a hunter, and he refuses to go down there to hunt anymore, as well as another friend I have. His dad says that the air down there is rich in death. I don't know the reason for what happens down there, but I won't be going back. This is the true story of my childhood through adult years as I recount it. 
Rattlesnake Road is an original name to a road that has since been changed. I used it to maintain anonymity. I was born on Long Island, New York, and ever since I can remember, I've had really strange experiences. I was never able to sleep at night, and from a young age, I was always terrified of the dark. Yes, every child is afraid of the dark, but I was afraid for a reason that I was unable to explain until later in life. There are a few stories from while I was there, but I want to fast forward to when I was a little bit older and things began to make sense to me. My family purchased a second home and we moved to Colorado. We lived on a ranch located at the top of a hill that fed into the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't much around us, a few neighbors, our barn with our animals, and thousands of acres of hilly and mountainous terrain that surrounded our family. There was a long dirt road that led to our property, Rattlesnake Road. It was a perfect shot of the scenery leading up to our small three-bedroom home. It was quiet, peaceful, but the land was old. I was about seven years old at the time. This is when I began to understand what I was going through wasn't normal. Our home was small. It was a ranch-style house with a three-car garage, which took up half of the structure. The other half was built into the hillside, where you entered from the front. You walked into the living room and you could see straight out the back sliding doors into the plains. In front of you was the kitchen, old with brick. Straight down the hallway, my room was on the right, my brother's room followed that, and lastly my parents' room was on the left. The bathrooms connected and were on the right as well, wrapping around to the back of the house. I left the hallway lights on when I slept. I was scared to begin with, but something always felt as though it wasn't just our family there. One night, I was up and I couldn't fall back asleep. My parents and brother were sleeping as well. I could hear them snoring down the hall. My bedroom door was open and I was facing the hallway, when suddenly, the pull string to my closet made a click and the lights popped on. I could see the light making its way through the slatted shades of my closet accordion doors, and my heart began to race. Then, they shut off. The air in the room became cold, tense, almost as though the oxygen was being siphoned out. The silence set in. I couldn't hear the snoring anymore. I couldn't hear anything. I looked toward the hallway, and there was a short, black static mist. It had no facial features, but what I could see would have been a mouth. It seemed as though it was smiling ear to ear, which paralyzed me with an intense feeling of dread. It passed out my doorway and out of sight, not making a sound. Moments later, I heard what sounded like the door to our garage open and close, and the air lifted. All of my surroundings returned to normal. I knew I was awake. I knew what I had seen there, and it visited me only to get worse as time went on. That image will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. I should lead by saying that I tend to lean towards skepticism when it comes to the paranormal. I 100% believe that paranormal entities exist. However, more often than not, I think people psych themselves out rather than have a genuine paranormal experience. In fact, that's why it's taken me so long to follow up on my situation. I'm reconsidering the weight of the situation now based on the behaviors of people that have been around this artifact that I have, as well as some of the things that have happened to me while I was looking into it. About two years ago, I found myself volunteering at an orphanage in Uganda for six months. 
I decided to go out there as a way to recover from my alcoholism and move forward with my life. While I was in Uganda, I also ended up being involved with getting a primary school started, and I assisted in getting a nonprofit off the ground. I was actually offered the position of operations manager at the nonprofit when I left the country, and the school was named after my friend and I in our honor. The point is, I was working really hard to have a good future, and I had succeeded in my recovery. In my last month in Uganda, a fellow volunteer gave me a gift. It was a Coptic cross that he had picked up in Ethiopia while he was on his way back into Uganda. I thought it was super cool and unique, so I got some string and fashioned it into a necklace to bring back to the States. I think it's important to note that the guy who gave it to me came from Trinidad and Tobago and outspokenly hated Americans. We clashed occasionally, but we both understood that we came from different places and ideas and just agreed to disagree. To be clear though, 90% of the time we were friends and on good terms. The very first peculiar experience happened to me about six months after I had gotten back home. I was in line to check out in a grocery store when I saw a man who looked like he was from Africa. It's hard to explain, but when you've been in a place long enough, you can pick up on their demeanor and their clothing and things like that. The man was just walking by when he looked at me, then at my necklace, and then back at me, but this time with a look of absolute terror. At the time, I didn't think much of it, but still, it stuck with me. Before my second experience, I had some friends comment on my necklace. I was told that it had some sort of weight to it, and that something about it felt weird. I ended up asking some co-workers about it since I knew some of them were heavy believers in the spirit realm. After I took it out and showed them, nobody was comfortable standing any closer than five feet from me. They prayed for me and sent me home with a prayer book which they claimed would keep me protected. At this point, I began to get paranoid, and I began recounting weird occurrences in my apartment. One example is that my two-week-long writer's block with my music production suddenly ceased when I moved the necklace out of my studio and into another room. I kept thinking of similar circumstances. The only problem here was that I couldn't quite convince myself that I wasn't just falling victim to my own placebo. I also remember the very distinct feeling of being watched, and I never really felt alone after that. One night, after overcoming my usual nightly restlessness, I fell into the comforts of sleep. The next thing I know, I had started a business in my hometown, a car wash, actually. I was showing a friend the place, and I let us all into the office. Everything in my office was neatly placed in its spot, just as it should have been. Suddenly, a man appeared walking past the doorway that exited from the side of the office into a car wash bay. Everything about the man's appearance was average. What was unsettling, though, was that I could tell that he knew I was watching him, even though he wasn't looking at me. It was just a gut feeling. The man disappeared as soon as I got a good look at him. I walked out the door in an attempt to see where he went. The man was nowhere to be seen. I walked back inside the side door of the office, and everything was trashed. I looked over at my friend and said that we needed to get the hell out of there. I led the way out of the front door, and laying on the ground in front of my feet was a horse. The horse was barely alive and was quite clearly in excruciating pain. I noticed it was missing two legs one in the front, and one in the rear. It was at that moment I realized I was in a dream, and I felt my subconscious start to panic. When I finally woke up, I was sweating and terrified. Needless to say, that sleep was not something I was going to attempt again that night. I was seriously freaked out, and decided to look into the possibility of a haunting. A week later, I found myself in the home of a spiritualist. I had made sure to leave the necklace outside, to see if she could sense it as a sort of vetting process. I also made a point to be aware not to make any hints toward my experience, and more importantly, that necklace. 
She had told me that she felt the presence of a demon about me, and that it was not from the necklace that I had left outside. Since I made sure not to mention anything that could lead her to know about that necklace, I trusted her reading. However, I politely left after she gave me an estimate for $200 to solve my problem. I know she needs to pay her bills too, I just didn't quite have that much money at the time. A week and a half later, I went to the office of my friend's pastor's friend. She was a Christian counselor who just so happened to have some expertise in the subject. I'm not a Christian, but I figured that it wasn't really a big deal since not everybody in counseling is a Christian. So, the appointment moved forward and I told her everything that had happened. She responded by doing some forearm muscle tests, which revealed that there were seven demons in me. She was able to relinquish six of them, and then things quickly escalated. Apparently, the seventh demon was a tier above most, and can't be renounced with spiritual faith. I admitted that I wasn't a Christian, but leaned toward agnosticism. I didn't think it was a problem because I answered that question in the introduction packet she gave me when I first walked in. Long story short, she berated me for 20 minutes, told me I was going to be stuck with this demon until the day that I'm a devout man of God, shamed me for coming to a Christian counselor without being a Christian, and charged me more than we initially agreed on. I think it's important to note that I don't think this is normal behavior for her. I obviously didn't know her very well but the shift in her demeanor was huge. I honestly couldn't even recognize her when she got angry. Apparently she's been in business for years and I can't imagine she would be remotely successful if she went off on every client that was simply looking for help but didn't align with her point of view. I suspect it might have been induced, but nonetheless, I left her office hurt and angry. A week or two later, I decided to go out to Haiti to volunteer for disaster relief. I'm in my motel in Miami overnight with a flight out to Port-au-Prince the next day. That night, I woke up with sleep paralysis. I've read stories about it and realized it was important to stay calm and wait for the rest of my body to wake up. Suddenly, my legs were thrown out from under me across the bed. My torso felt like it was being pushed around. The next minute consisted of my body being thrown helplessly around the bed while I quietly prayed with all of my might. When I did, it ended abruptly and I waited until the sun rose to relax. I ended up missing my first flight the next morning by a fluke. I booked another ticket the following day, but I was given the wrong time of my flight and I missed that one as well. In the last six months, I have lost my jobs, isolated myself from friends, I am practically homeless and I have had to file for bankruptcy. My ever so promising career in music is now gone and I am ashamed of myself because I never made it out to Haiti. I don't know if there is any merit to paranormal interference. I can chalk up the nightmare to my subconscious thoughts, the sleep paralysis to muscle spasms, and everything else to paranoia, but the unexplainable portions are well, unexplained. Edit. Yesterday, I drove up to a spot on the mountain that I know pretty well. I crossed two creeks and walked a mile into the forest until I found a spot that I could easily recognize. I had the cross wrapped in a cloth that I had drenched in boiled salt water and let dry. I had also cleansed it myself before I left. I dug a small hole by the base of a tree and dropped the cloth-covered cross into the ground. I took out my Bible and read a select verse, prayed for it to leave me alone, and then addressed it directly. I demanded in the name of God that it will not follow me home or bother me anymore, and that it would be staying there. I've come back home and I've only felt better since. Granted, it's only been a few days, but I've been acting more like myself. My productivity has improved vastly, and most importantly, I don't feel burdened by that feeling of constantly being watched. It looks like that did the trick. Although, if I ever do need to get back the cross, I have the exact coordinates memorized.
This happened when I was little, and I recently remembered it when talking to my parents this weekend about strange things we did as a kid. They told me that this one spoils them to this day, and after talking, I actually have one or two vague memories of it. This story took place when my family and I still lived in a small neighborhood in Alabama. We had moved into a small house that had a backyard, which connected to a small forest. I believe I was six at the time, and my younger brother had just been born. My parents got the house for less than expected, and were excited to start a new life in this quiet neighborhood. The first night at the house, my parents said they heard scratching coming from somewhere in the house. My dad said that he brushed it off as being an animal from the forest nearby, or maybe a mouse, and went back to sleep. It continued for several nights though, and my dad eventually grew tired of it. One night, he decided to look and see what was causing the scratching noise. He found me kneeling at and scratching the door that led to the basement. He tried talking to me, but I would just continue to scratch. My dad watched me for a minute before I finally stopped scratching and walked back to my room. The next morning, he asked me about why I was up and according to him, I didn't know what he was talking about. My parents took me to the doctor and they told them that the most logical cause was that I was having night terrors since it appeared to occur nightly. My parents accepted this as an answer for a while. The thing was, I would only have night terrors in that specific house. Whenever we would spend the night at my grandparents or I would have a sleepover at my friend's house, I never had these night terrors. And then there came one part that I somehow remember. It happened when I was a little older, around nine or 10. I remember waking up in the hallway where the basement door was. I didn't remember getting up and I was confused as to how I got there. I remember turning my head to see what looked like an elderly man. He had a kind of yellowish glow to him, and he was staring right at me. I don't remember feeling threatened by him though. I think I might have fallen asleep again, because the next thing I remember is waking up in the hallway again, but this time it was morning. After the night where I saw the old man, my parents said my night terrors stopped. We moved out of that house several years later, when I was getting ready to go into the third grade. My parents brought up this story because they told me that recently, one of our old neighbors had done some research on the house. What they found out was that an old man had unalived himself in the basement of that house years before my family had moved in. Our neighbor didn't tell them the full story over what led to that, but my parents believe that that might have been the old man that I saw that night. I'm now 20 years old and I'm enrolled in college. Neither I nor my parents have been back to that house since we moved out of it. In a way, I kind of want to visit just one last time to see if maybe I could find out about the old man. I'm just really curious about him. Either way, it was an experience I doubt my parents will forget anytime soon. This is a true story that happened to me, which I am weary to share, as there have been many times where I have opened up about this only to be met with ridicule. I hope you'll take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends, like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings, Bryce, the residential hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. 
I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two I will share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was my girlfriend, me, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, then a quick right, and you're in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand and the camera in my right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left, at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and the light, thought I saw it again and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of two frames, she is half behind the door, and in the next frame she's gone. My heart felt like an ice cube ran through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody that I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger girl, maybe younger than 10, hair parted in the middle, unusually large forehead, and some apparent deformation or disorder. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. I know, I know, but it's the truth. This is where it gets weirder. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that the windows grow back. If you do any damage to them, they'll just grow back over and spirits will follow you home. Well, I broke a window. I was laying in bed one night at about three or four in the morning. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of about 20 seconds. Once it fully covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. It gave me shivers. And for some reason, I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped and it left me on the verge of tears. I don't know what possessed me to say that, but it was really emotional and terrifying. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to the legend, it makes sense. Either way, it's the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. This started a few years ago, and so far, there's been no explanation of the things that keep occurring. I live in the southern United States near a national park in a fairly rural area. So our first guess was that this had to be some sort of wildlife, something that was scaring us for no reason other than us getting into our own heads. However, after a ton of internal explanations, we finally came to the conclusion that we had none. The first thing that occurred was fairly brief. It was shortly after the death of my uncle, who was fairly close to us before he passed. He was a veteran, and while in the army, he had volunteered to have shock treatments that altered his personality greatly. This had occurred during the Vietnam era while he was stationed in Germany. My grandmother was in the bathroom and I was in my room just playing a game. When out of the blue, the wall sounded as if somebody was beating on it, 
trying to get our attention. Three loud knocks, then nothing. We were worried that something had happened to our neighbor, an elderly woman, and that she needed our help. But after we went outside to check, there was nobody there. Fast forward a few months, we started hearing footsteps on the roof. They started out light and easily explainable, something along the lines of a cat walking on the roof. We had seen it happening a few times, so we thought nothing of it, until they started to get a bit heavier. Eventually, it sounded like something that weighed a lot more than a cat, even more than I did, was sprinting across the roof every night from one end of the house to the other. Things got worse after that. We started to find dead animals around the property, and while some of it could easily be explained as roadkill, we do have a lot of problems with people speeding due to a lack of police presence in the area, there was also a ton of random things that we would find dead nearby. We would find crows and ravens laying in our backyard, the occasional snake. And one time, we found a deer that apparently walked onto our property and dropped dead. There was not a single sign of a wound or anything when we found it. We started to hear things inside the house soon after, seeing things out of the corner of our eyes that would vanish before we could turn to get a good look at it. Scratching mainly, We've put rat traps and every kind of poison we could think of in our walls, but there's no sign of vermin. We would hear whispers at night, like somebody was trying to talk to us. We're rational people. We checked to see if there were any cracks in the windows or door frames that could make the wind blow in and sound strange. But from everything that we've checked, there doesn't seem to be any opening that could make that noise. One of my old friends, who before this story was as skeptical as I was, was sitting in my living room playing something on our PlayStation when he thought he saw somebody walk past the window. It doesn't sound too scary, right? Well, no, until you consider that my windows are nearly 10 feet off the ground. Our house is raised to allow water to pass underneath it to prevent any water damage and the place that he claims to have seen the man wasn't near any stairs. He came to visit another time about a month later. We were sitting and talking to one another when he said that he needed to use the bathroom and he left to do his business. He goes and when he comes back, he's pale white and terrified. When I asked him what was wrong, he was evasive. So we just got in the car and drove down to Sonic to grab some food and talk. That's when he told me that he saw somebody staring at him from my room as he walked back, smiling at him, and that it had yellow eyes. He doesn't come around anymore. At least he doesn't stay after nightfall. I don't know if what he claims is true or not, but it still scares me to think about just how scared he was. He's just not the type, so I'm inclined to believe him. I've tried cleansing the house with sage. We've got a crucifix in every room now. Near the front door, we have three. We've even duct taped the back door shut and we have it locked to be absolutely certain that nothing can get in. We just don't have any explanation. Back when I was 18 or 19, I had decided to go to church. It was a church in Cherokee, Alabama, and I went with my once friend, we'll call him Joel, and his family. I had gone in, and Joel and I were directed to the basement with all of the other people who were under 20 to do something. Some kind of class, maybe. I forget what it was. But maybe five to seven minutes in that basement, I get the most blinding headache and excuse myself outside to get some air. I wait for everybody to get done and we head back to where Joel and his parents lived. The whole ride, this headache is just not going away. I stayed at their house maybe an hour or two 
while this headache gets worse and worse. I decide to attempt to drive myself home to Crooked Oak. As I'm driving, the headache becomes all but blinding, and halfway home, in the night, on this dark road, I stop at this tiny little backwoods church. The pain is so immense I can't focus on anything, at which point I was pretty much wishing to be struck dead just to escape it. I stumbled out of my Jeep, and I landed on the first bit of grass I could find, and I pretty much passed clear out. After a good stretch of time, the pain left me. I went to drag myself to the Jeep, and with my senses returned, I realized that I was laying on someone's old grave. I don't know why it helped, and of course I didn't do it intentionally, but there it is. To this day, I refuse to go near that church. I don't know what's in that basement, but I don't want to encounter it again. I've always been a believer in the paranormal, but I've also been a skeptic. I'm not one to jump to paranormal conclusions right away. With that said, this event messed me up, and it still keeps me up at night to this day. This happened almost a year ago. My girlfriend and I visited her parents' house, which was her old home in Alabama, specifically in Crenshaw County. For those that don't know, that's basically right in the middle of nowhere. The boonies, the sticks. Being from a large city myself in Southern California, I'm completely out of my element. I've already visited her parents once before with her. She has always told me that her house was haunted and that the woods were sketchy at night. But when I visited the first time with her, nothing happened whatsoever. So I chalked it up as some tall tale to creep me out you know, freak out the city boy. That is, until we visited her parents the second time. Her father works in Montgomery for the weekdays, so he's gone a lot, and her mother had to be in Atlanta for three days due to a job. We were home alone for those three days, unless you want to count her cats as well. The one-story house is in the middle of absolutely nowhere, with the nearest house well down the road from us. One of those nights, around midnight, I'm sitting in bed with her completely asleep. I'm scrolling through Facebook and my Twitter and YouTube notifications when I began hearing what sounded like my girlfriend's voice. I turned to look at her to see if she was sleep talking. Nothing. She's quiet. I continue going through my notifications for a bit and I hear her again. But this time it doesn't sound like it's coming from her. It sounds like it's coming from outside, behind the bedroom wall, toward the same direction as my girlfriend, but much louder and echoey. I get up and I look around to see if there's a TV on or if the cats are making noises, even though the TVs aren't in the direction that I heard the voice coming from. But nothing. The TVs are off and the cats are asleep or just lazing around. I even checked her phone, which was on the nightstand to my right, in case it was playing audio or something, but it was just charging. I go back to bed with her and I continue going about my business, but this time I'm kind of looking out for the voice. This time I hear it again, but much clearer and louder, and it sounds exactly like my girlfriend's voice. It was for sure coming from outside this time, I know this because she was sleeping on my left, and toward my left is also the wall. On the other side of that is a clearing, and it's all dense woods. After this, I focused all of my attention to the loud voice to see if I would hear it again, and I'm looking at her to make sure that it's not her. This is the part where I internally started saying, I am not finding out what you are. I have seen way too many movies and YouTube videos and I'm not about to go out there and find out. I heard the voice one more time, yet this time it didn't sound closer, but just a little farther, 
which leads me to believe that it's something physically moving around the clearing bordering the woods. The scariest thing about the voice that really had me freaking out is that it was still clear enough that I started making out human speech, but it was messed up. Like it was speaking in phrases using my girlfriend's voice, but none of the words were making sense. It's almost like it was trying to speak English, but it was reversed. At that point, I did one final check around the interior of the house to see if all the doors were locked. My rational mind was thinking, it was probably just some lost person in the woods. Definitely not a skinwalker or whatever else. I made sure the curtains were closed and I just went to bed. I told my girlfriend the very next morning and she seemed rightfully freaked out, but we ended up just cracking jokes about it to cope. I posted this experience to Facebook about a week after, and a lot of my friends threw around the thought that it could very well have been something paranormal. A friend of my girlfriend's who studies cryptozoology as a hobby asked me a ton of questions relating to the incident and basically flat out said, yeah, that's a Wendigo. I don't know how credible of an opinion that would be. I'm inching into believing it though, because what I heard that night was exactly my girlfriend's voice. I swear I could make out my name in that garbled speech. I'm not too sure on that much, but it was like it was luring me into the woods. Whatever it was, it got my girlfriend's voice, pitch, tone, patterns, everything, just right enough for me to listen, but not enough to get me to go out there with it. Of course, I was looking at her, so I knew it wasn't her. Who knows what I might have done, I guess, if she hadn't been in the room with me. I haven't been back since, but we are planning to go back in October and go to Disney World with her family. I'm hoping that whatever it was isn't there anymore. When I was a kid, I lived in Alabama, way out in the country. My best friend at the time lived about a mile away, and my older brother and I would go over there daily during the summer. Near his property is a dead forest. All the trees are there, but they never have any leaves. It's pretty darn creepy to begin with. Sometimes we played in there, but we never went very far. One day, my brother and my friend, let's call him Sam, wandered off while I was messing with a turtle, and they disappeared. Once I was done playing with the turtle, not hurting it or anything, I went around the property looking for them, until I thought I saw one of them head into the woods. By this time, it was late afternoon and getting darker. I ran to the woods, but I couldn't see them. Then I heard what sounded like them talking, deeper in. I followed the voices and they kept seeming farther and farther away, as though I should have been getting closer. And then they stopped. And suddenly I felt really scared. At that moment, I realized that the sun had already set and it was starting to get very dark. So I ran all the way back to Sam's house. My older brother and Sam were playing Nintendo in his room and thought that I was still in the backyard playing with the turtle. I never did figure out what I was chasing in those creepy woods, but I'm kind of glad that I never did. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. 
I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal. My alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55 and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about 7, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had streetlights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no streetlights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far-off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about 10 feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet which was only about five to 10 yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver 
to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, it's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically, I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, some she tells us about, others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses 
standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shapeshift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the sun was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down, and that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong, and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if you would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. The Hike That Never Ended My encounter on the trails of Mount San Antonio in California, also known as Mount Baldy, still sends shivers down my spine. I've always been an avid hiker, seeking out nature's challenges. Mount Baldy, with its rugged beauty and challenging trails, seemed like the perfect weekend escape. But that weekend turned into a surreal, never-ending loop of confusion and fear. I started my hike early in the morning, the sun just beginning to cast its golden hues over the landscape. The trail was clear, and I was well prepared with supplies and a map. I planned to reach the summit and return before dusk. The ascent was breathtaking, both in its scenic beauty and in its physical demand. I reached the summit by early afternoon, feeling a sense of accomplishment as I took in the panoramic view. After a short rest, I began my descent, expecting it to be straightforward. But as I hiked down, an unsettling fog began to roll in, thick and disorienting. I checked my compass and map frequently, but something seemed off. The trail markers, once clear, now became sporadic and hard to follow. The landscape, so familiar on my ascent, felt strangely different. Hours passed, and I should have been nearing the base, but the trail just kept going. The fog grew denser, and a chilling sense of isolation set in. I tried to retrace my steps, thinking I might have taken a wrong turn, but the path behind me was just as confusing. As night fell, I realized I was lost. The fog was so thick now that my flashlight barely cut through it. I decided to stop and set up a makeshift camp, hoping to wait out the fog until morning. But the strangest part came with the dawn. When the sun rose, the fog lifted, revealing not the familiar trails of Mount Baldy, but an unrecognizable, dense forest. I was on a completely different path, one I had no recollection of taking. My map was useless here. Panicked, I started walking, hoping to find my way out or run into another hiker. 
but the forest seemed endless, the trees a repeating pattern of eerie similarity. I walked for hours, but it felt like I wasn't making any progress at all. It was as if the forest was reshaping itself around me. Then I heard voices, distant and echoing. They seemed to be calling my name. I followed them thinking that it might be other hikers or a search party looking for me, but the voices led me in circles, always out of reach, their whispers tinged with an unsettling familiarity. By the time I found my way out of the forest, it was night again. I emerged onto a trail that led me back to the base of Mount Baldy. How I got there, or where I had been, I still can't explain. I was found by a park ranger, who told me I had been missing for two days. They'd been searching for me, thinking that I had fallen or injured myself. The experience on Mount Baldy has left me bewildered and deeply unsettled. I've hiked those trails before and since, and nothing like that has ever happened again. I can't explain the shifting landscape, the endless forest, or the voices that seem to echo out of nowhere. The hike on Mount Baldy was more than just a physical journey. It was a brush with something I have no way of understanding. And whatever it was, it will be with me forever. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10 minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes, Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart, but I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the boards settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them, Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. 
I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day, and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated, the same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, Oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and, other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. And that digital camera my twin was playing around with there was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study, where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, Ouch! very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone. I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, 
which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize at this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath, and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil, like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. Thirteen and three. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. My husband's parents live in a tiny town in Alabama. They've lived there a long time. We went to visit them a few years back, and we were excited to get out of town for a bit, see some different scenery. His sister was graduating college, and we were going to celebrate. She is also an avid ghost hunter and believer. So when I told her about some of my experiences, she was excited to take me to some of the haunted locations around town cemeteries, old abandoned houses, and even a Hell's Gate, which we didn't actually end up going to, as I told her I had a bad feeling and refused. We drove around almost all night, just looking at different locations and talking about the history of the town. A lot of residual energy and weird feelings as we went to all these different places. We came to a cemetery in a new portion of town, Fancy houses surrounded it on three sides only. On the third side was a small canyon area of land. Nothing really felt off. The cemetery was new and didn't have many headstones yet. It was fenced off with ornate wrought iron fencing. We didn't see anything lurking, no shadows darting from tree to tree or headstone to headstone. It was just there. After walking around to the open side, 
where there were no houses. I asked his sister, let's call her Beth, how come there were no houses on this one side? She shrugged and said that they had stopped building months ago, even though this was supposed to be a new subdivision. They had purchased all this land and probably needed to figure out a way to build upon it since it was very canyon-like. We decided to get a closer look at the canyon area, although we couldn't see much since it was dark and our only lights were the street lights. We had walked far enough to be outside of what they illuminated. Far off in the distance, I saw what looked like a campfire. I pointed it out, but no one else saw it. Beth began to have a sinking feeling, and before she could say anything, I started getting a massive headache. I heard pounding like drums. I got flashes of images in my head, of Native Americans dancing around a big fire. The night sky seemed blacker and darker than it had before. Beth grabbed my arms and said we needed to leave. My husband was already halfway back to the car. As I turned my back to the canyon, it was almost as though I had a twinge of fear run up my spine and a shiver, like I was somewhere we weren't supposed to be. So we ran back to the car. As we drove away, I could feel a black mass following our car as we drove the winding streets back to the main road. It felt big and foreboding, like it was flying behind us. I started to panic and I felt my throat and chest tighten. Once we crossed the main road, it was almost like it couldn't follow us past that point, but I could feel it, watching us as we continued back to his parents' house. I asked Beth if she had seen anything, but she refused to talk about it. None of us slept that night, and my headache didn't subside until morning. I did some research on the area the next day and found that it was home to the Chickasaw Indian tribe back in the day. I have Blackfoot and Choctaw blood, and later thought that maybe, since I was a neighboring tribe, they didn't want me there. Regardless, we have never spoken of the incident since. My family owns a factory in the north of England. The building is 1890s as far as I can tell, and was built as a large shed for boilers that provided steam to power the steam engines in the big mill next door. The mill has since been demolished. It has a large water tank underneath it and a system to collect rainwater. The roof is made with cast iron trestles that incorporate internal gutters. It's fascinating. My brother is convinced that the place is haunted. Stuff apparently moves around on its own, and voices have been heard in the factory from the office when the factory was empty. We had an old bloke working for us a few years back who swears he saw the ghost of a man on several occasions. He did used to secretly drink several cans of John Smith's bitter whilst on shift though, so who knows. But he's not the only one. So far, I haven't experienced anything. But if I do, I'll be sure to let you know. When I was 15 or so, a group of my friends and I all slept over at the leader of our friend group's house. This guy lived in the most absolutely rural area of our rural town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out and start a bonfire deep in the woods, so we packed up got all of our materials and went straight out there. On the way to the spot that we'd be making our campfire at, he told us about how messed up and creepy his woods are and the numerous things he's seen. White skinny figures peeking around the shed 
staring at him and running off when he looked at it, screaming and whispers from the woods, figures watching him, all that good stuff. It set the mood pretty well. By around seven o'clock that night, we had the campfire set up and it was pitch black outside as it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire. I can still remember how creepy the whole vibe was that night. You couldn't see a single thing besides the ring of light coming from the fire. Everything else was just a black wall of nothingness and the sound of the forest was so quiet that the silence was almost deafening. At least it was if we weren't talking. We ended up needing more firewood and a few other things that we were using for the campfire, so the leader took me to go with him to get it. Without a flashlight or any light source, he and I walked the mile and a half long trail back to his house in complete and utter darkness. It was all good, we were talking, joking with each other, having a good time and just hanging out when the first noises started. He immediately made me stop talking. To my left and my right were a bunch of different sounds. Screaming, laughing, talking and whispering, shouting, people saying unintelligible words. It sounded like there was something around 20 people just surrounding us. The natural night vision had finally set in a decent amount and I looked over at my friend, who had his head down, and didn't say a single word. Known for being a complete goofball and a wild, funny dude, I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look to him that still kind of haunts me to this day, as I knew him pretty well and he always portrayed himself as the fearless leader type. Seeing him so shaken up and afraid was very unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, what the heck is that? Before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward, and not to pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said, and the next three minutes or so were incredibly uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach by the time we reached his house, the sounds had stopped. We both grabbed what we needed in total silence. That's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of that night. No birds, no sticks falling, not a single sound, absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night. It's still my most unsettling and bizarre experience that I have no explanation for, and I'll never forget it. I used to live in this old house with my grandparents out in the middle of nowhere in the south of Alabama. The closest town was maybe 30 to 40 minutes drive away. The land we lived on was my pop's family land and it was passed down through many generations. I was in middle school when all of this took place. I have always had problems sleeping at night so my grandparents let me stay up at night. This one night I remember to this day because my best friend, who's basically my sister, was with me at the time. We were in the second living room, what I call the family room, and we were just having fun talking, girl sleepover type stuff. The family room connected to the dining room. We had the windows open because it was a hot summer night in this old house that didn't have air. My friend and I were playing, and out of nowhere, I felt this unknown energy. For some reason, everything went dead silent. I looked at the open window and I saw the curtain blowing. I thought it was the wind, but I was so wrong. The wind wasn't blowing, not at this time. None of the other curtains were billowing. Out of nowhere, I see the silhouette of a woman. 
The description I would give of her would be like a 1950s housewife, with her dress and straight hair, but the end curled out. I looked at her for so long, trying to wrap my brain around what was going on. I was a little scared of her, but I didn't feel like I was in danger. She disappeared. And when she did, the curtain quit blowing and everything went back to normal. I thought I was crazy, but then my friend looked at me and said, you saw that too, right? I nodded yes. Both she and I went to the window to see if anybody was out there and to see if the wind was blowing, but no to both. What really freaked us out was how far out in the middle of nowhere we were. There's no reason that anybody else would even be out there. And after that, I have never seen her again. In the summer of 2008, when I was 13, my encounters with the unexplained began. I spent my days at home, alone, and everything was normal, until our dogs kept ending up outside. Then things escalated. I began hearing unexplained sounds in the house, like footsteps pacing the hallway and faint whispers. My mom confirmed she heard them too, but warned me not to tell my religious stepdad. The rest of that year went by without incident but 2010 marked the escalation of paranormal activity. That year, my twin sister and her friend captured a strange, smoky presence in a photo. My mom even heard a voice whisper, ouch, in her ear. But the most extreme occurrences were yet to come, and they happened to me alone. My first brush with sleep paralysis was relatively calm, but a series of inexplicable events followed. All in a row, in one event, a cup in my room tipped over on its own, a bird hit my window, my light bulb exploded, and the cup fell again. I was spooked, but I tried to brush it off. The final and most haunting incident occurred a week later during my second episode of sleep paralysis. As I lay immobilized, my room darkened, and then it turned blood red. A robed figure appeared in my doorway, its eyes piercing into me, radiating evil. The numbers 13 and three appeared, and then the paralysis ended. Later at church, we read Psalm 13, three. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. I was chilled to the core, and to this day nothing has disturbed me more than that shadowy figure and those words. These events have left a lasting impact, and although I've had some mild paranormal experiences since then, nothing compares to the terror of that year. Even after losing my faith, the mystery of what I saw and felt still lingers. This is a recollection of a campout I had a few summers ago. The exact details have started to become fuzzy, but I'll try to relay it as best I can. It was Boy Scout camp, northern Wisconsin. There's maybe a little over a dozen of us, some scout leaders too, all within a little clearing that makes up where one of many troops are set up. Two boys to each tent. My best friend and I from very early childhood are tent buddies. And on maybe the third night at this camp is when all of this happened. I remember falling asleep pretty normally. It was dark and I wasn't the last one to leave the campfire after dinner. My friend and I were both in our sleeping bags on opposite sides of the tent, our bags at our side and our hiking boots right by the door, carefully removed when we entered the tent. 
I woke up to strange sounds, hard breathing or maybe soft grunting. It was the dead of night, 2 to 3 a.m. must have been. I'm frozen and I look around at the walls of the tent, but nothing seems amiss, just this heavy, low, breathy sound. I see that my buddy is awake at this point and we're both frozen, terrified. He opened his mouth to say something, but I put a finger to my lips, like the shh gesture. Behind his head, right where he's laying, something is brushing up against the tent wall, poking into the fabric, almost in the shape of an antler. My friend sees it and lets out a small gasp. Something pokes through the tent suddenly, sharp and black, not an antler. A loud exhale, and then whatever it was just steps back. We hear branches crunch and twigs snap, fading into the distance. We stayed awake for another hour, in hushed whispers trying to rationalize what just happened. I asked if we should check outside the tent. Neither of us remember falling asleep again, but we must have, because we woke up in the morning. The hole in the tent was still there, along with three to four similar ones on various sides of our tent. By the time the other boys in the camp were waking up, I had the courage to check around the tent to see if there were footprints or broken twigs, something, just to determine what had been outside of our tent. Well, I found something. Behind our tent, I kid you not, were bare human footprints. They circled around our tent several times but they never led to or from the tent. Just three to four rings of human footprints in a loop. Whatever it was that happened, whatever it was that was there, my buddy and I talked about it a few more times on that trip. But ever since, we won't speak of it to each other. I've never told this story to anyone before, simply due to not having any answers and thinking that there's nothing that can be gained from telling it, but eventually I figured, why not? Maybe somebody knows what I saw. Many, many years ago, at Wangi Campgrounds in Queensland, Australia, my father, my friend, and I were out camping for a couple of days. Usually it's packed, but we went during the week and got two days off school. I can't remember the reason. I think it was just because my dad had a few days off, but that's beside the point. Due to it being midweek, the grounds were empty. We've been here many, many times before, but never alone. However, we were excited due to having the whole grounds to ourselves. Cool, right? Now, we're no strangers to the Australian bush. We know what to look out for. We know how to play it safe. So at night, knowing that nobody was around to mess with our camp, we decided to go for a mini bushwalk to the other side of the river that runs along the grounds. When I say grounds, it's just a clearing in the middle of a bush, not a properly established grounds, and it's far away from all the roads. We got to the opposite riverside, and looking out to the river, we could see a bright light just near our campgrounds. Thinking it could have been the fire, I mean, we put it out, but they could easily relight, we walked back through the bush to our site, still able to see the large light. However, when we got to our side, we realized that it wasn't the fire. As we were able to be closer to the river this time, we saw that the light was over the river, not in it, but over it. We were somewhat scared, but thought that there had to be some explanation for it. Maybe a flashlight or a torch, something along those lines. Maybe a torch or something along those lines. But looking from where we were, there was nothing under it. The light was a good 70-ish centimeters above the water, 
end still, dead still. The light itself was flickering, sort of like a fire, but it was in no way attached to anything. It was just a large ball, like between a tennis ball and a soccer ball, floating and giving off a strong fire-like light, but more like a light bulb center. This went on for maybe 30 minutes as we tried splashing the water and trying to figure out what it was, but it didn't move. It didn't do anything. It just floated at that one spot, in complete silence, unlike the sound a fire would make. My dad decided to go get the torch and his camera, and of course, being the scared 12-year-olds we were, we went with them. As soon as we got to the campsite, which was maybe only 100 meters away, the light was gone. We ran back with the torch, but there was nothing there, and no one there no other campers. It was just gone. We didn't really talk about it because we didn't know what it was, or how it was there, or why it was there. Min Min lights are something that are very popular in the Australian outback, and that's the only explanation that I've got for it. But they have no explanation, so it's a dead end. I've always been a big fan of ghost stories and spooky things, but I've never had a story happen directly to me. I've always wanted to or have been excited by experiencing these things. I've just never had an incident that has made me fully commit to saying I've had a ghost experience. However, I usually ask people that I'm comfortable with, do you have any ghost stories? Most of the time I hear some pretty great stories. I have a lot from family, and some crazy ones from my girlfriend, who I think is like the boy from The Sixth Sense. I'm generally quite a skeptic, but I have fun getting a spooky story nonetheless. Last night when I was at work, I asked my boss if he has any ghost stories. He said that he did. He told me this story whilst cleaning up the bar that he owns. I can only take it as truth, as he admitted to me that he's still somewhat skeptical about it all. But the more he thinks about it, the more he thinks it was a ghost encounter, rather than just a strange occurrence. This is a story that he retold to me, while we both admitted to getting goosebumps. My boss Tom was living in the UK and was moving out to Sydney, Australia to work on a big project that required long round-the-clock hours. This included working primarily in front of his laptop. Tom's wife's stepsister owned a house here in Sydney that was located in a rather old-timey area near the ports and docks. The stepsister was going away for a while and offered her townhouse for Tom to stay in whilst he was working on this crazy busy project. So he flew out and stayed there, by himself. The main bedroom was located on the top floor of the townhouse. At the far end of the room, there was a slant in the roof that only gave a small amount of distance to the floor and the roof. So the designers made a built-in wardrobe to make use of the awkward space. The bed was situated near the doors of these wardrobes, though I don't know how far. One night when Tom was asleep, he was woken up by the sound of deep sobbing. He woke up in a panic and was thinking that it was possibly a fox, as they roughly make the sound of a crying baby at times. The tone was kind of low and made him think that it was a man. He also noticed that the cries were coming from the wardrobe area, which also backed into the wall that was shared with the neighbors. Not thinking much about it, he thought maybe the neighbors were having a rough night and he tried to sleep again. This happened again the next night, and then the night after that. Eventually, Tom was woken up by the sobbing sound and started to get more suspicious of it rather than ignoring it. He sat up in bed and was looking at the wardrobe doors in the dark. He heard the cries for a moment until one of the wardrobe doors popped open, right at the moment that he was sitting up, paying attention to them. Tom jumped out of bed at this sight and raised his fist in the air, getting ready to punch or defend himself at whoever came out of it. But no one did. Nothing did. He stood there for a moment, then grabbed his bag and hurried downstairs. Tom, sitting in the lounge room downstairs, got his things and prepared for the day and decided to stay at a friend's house for the remaining days he had in Australia, 
because he was getting too spooked to go and sleep there another night. Trying to be rational about it, Tom thought that maybe the things in the wardrobe were pushed up against the door and it just popped open. The more he thinks about it though, the more he thinks about how strange it was. He never spoke to his stepsister about it, out of embarrassment, I guess. Years later, they were at a family function and he was talking to her about the time he stayed there and asked her about her neighbors and who lived next door. The stepsister said to him that the next door house had been unoccupied since she bought the place. Nobody was living there. I have strong reason to believe that Tom was telling the truth in this story, as you just tell when people are trying to get a rise out of you, you know? Or tell the best story in town? This just wasn't the case. Either way, after hearing that story, I just had to share it. I just want to mention a few key points before I share some of the things that happened. I am not looking for attention. Everything contained within this story is 100% factual. I'm an Australian, and these occurrences happened on the central coast of New South Wales. I am an avid outdoorsman with a keen interest and in-depth knowledge of Australian native fauna. Each of these occurrences have a witness apart from myself. I don't claim these events are paranormal, yet I am, to this day, still without a reasonable explanation. Occurrence number one. I live on the New South Wales central coast in an area that has houses in close proximity to Brisbane Water National Park, literally within meters from some back fences. Myself and my partner hold a keen interest which sees us venture into the bushland regularly. For argument's sake, let's say we are avid bird watchers. A few weeks ago, the local fire service commenced backburning in parts of the Brisbane Water National Park over two days or so, which was obviously for hazard reduction. Most of the fire was directed at burning off leaf litter and dry debris, which covers the ground, in an effort to reduce the chances of spot fires, which have in the past become large fires and threatened houses and caused neighboring suburbs to be evacuated. Because of the way the back burning was controlled, it completely burned off the debris and basically 90% of flora that was over two or so feet seemed to have survived, except for some light charring, of course. Even some grass plants survived while others were completely burned, including their underground roots, which left large round circles in the substrate. This meant that the canopy was fully intact, and this is an important point to the story. The fire was controlled so well that the left-hand side was completely obliterated by fire while the right-hand side was untouched. The path is about three to four feet wide at its widest points. Anyway, about 48 hours after the fire service had finished backburning, my partner and I ventured into a large patch of Brisbane Water National Park along a track that we have walked no less than 200 times in the last decade. The first thing we noticed, of course, was the lack of small shrubs and ground cover, which had been replaced by a 3 to 4 centimeter layer of ash. It was also hard not to notice the smell and non-visible smokiness which irritated our throats and noses, but by far the most profound thing we noticed was just how quiet it was. Usually we hear birds chirping, snakes slithering into the underbrush, lizards scampering out of the way, and ducks splashing around in the creek that runs along the whole length of the walking track on the right. Across the creek, there are literally kilometers of bush in all directions, so it was a little odd that it was so desolate, even after backburning. We decided to press on, even though we were pretty sure that we weren't going to see any wildlife. We continued along the track for another 20 minutes or so, all the while chatting about nothing in particular, when all of a sudden we both jerk our heads to the left to see two vertical vines which stand at about six feet tall and four centimeters or so in circumference come toward us like they've been shook, held back and released sort of like a slingshot. 
We immediately run over to the trees, four meters or so off the track, because we thought it might have been caused by wildlife. My first instinct was to look up, as it may have been a large bird fleeing, but there were no birds at all in any of the trees, and we would have seen and heard the wings flapping and it breaking through the canopy. It wasn't any type of guanas, we've only had two types which occur naturally here, and both are arboreal and will take to the nearest tree when threatened. We checked every tree, every hollow log and any type of ground cover which survived the fire and found nothing. It definitely wasn't any type of marsupial because it would have been spotted when we checked the trees and surrounding ground cover. It also wasn't any type of snake, as the only arboreal snake we have locally which weighs in kilos is the diamond python, which I could spot from a mile away. We continued walking for another three kilometers or so along the track, and the whole time felt like we were being watched. I was quite uneasy, but that feeling completely left as soon as we turned around and backtracked and headed toward home. Occurrences 2 and 3 my partner and I went out on another adventure, but this time we were looking for nocturnal animals to photograph. We went to a waterfall, which was only about 15 minutes from our house, but is rather secluded and completely dead at night and on weekdays. Funnily enough, it becomes packed on the weekends during the day in the warmer months. The layout of the waterfall is basically a large parking lot at the stop of the waterfall which has a small park with barbecues, tables, and a small block of toilets. From the parking lot, you can also access the very top of the waterfall, which is basically a rock escarpment with water running through it. You can also access stairs that take you down to both the middle of the waterfall, which is just a huge rock platform, and the very bottom of the waterfall. It takes about 20 minutes to walk from top to bottom. We parked the car and I grabbed my gear, which included my camera. We start making our way toward the top of the falls, which has a two-foot barrier you have to step over to access the rock escarpment. Right as I went to put my leg over the fence, I heard the most disturbing noise I've ever heard. It sounded like a human, moaning in pain, but to describe it the best I can, imagine having ten different people with ten different voice qualities, all making the same moaning sound at the same time. I'm not one to frighten easily, but I have to admit, it sent chills up my spine. I told my partner to hurry up and get back to the car, and I locked the doors as soon as we got in and left in a hurry. Now, this place is pitch dark. There are zero lights, and there's no way in hell you'd be there without a torch. Not to mention, you would be able to tell if anybody was there by the cars parked in the parking lot, as this is not a place that you would walk to. When I told a close friend of mine, who also frequents the waterfall to photograph wildlife, he told me that he also had an experience the night before, which was the night after I was there. He had finished work late and thought he'd go for a quick walk around to see what he could find. This was in the Australian spring when everything is out and about due to the warm and humid weather. He said he had parked his car and got about halfway down the stairs to the bottom of the falls when he came across a snake. He was photographing it when he heard the door of the toilet block being slammed repeatedly. He started running up the steps to get back to his car and said as he was running up, it sounded like something was going mental, slamming things within the toilet block. He got in his car and left. My friend and I decided to go check out the waterfall that night to see if we could find anything. We parked the car and went straight to the toilet block. We checked the block that he had heard the commotion from and found a reasonably large amount of blood inside the basin and a small pool in the basin's soap dish. We contemplated calling the police but weren't sure exactly what we would report. We left soon after and neither of us visited the place for over a month. Since then we've been back to this place multiple times without any incident. Occurrence number four, the last occurrence. Now on to last night. We headed out along a road on the central coast, which by day is rather busy due to the high number of residences and farms that are along this road. 
but by night is usually very quiet, with a few cars using it sporadically. So I have my high beams on 95% of the time. We drove along this road for about 40 minutes in search of marsupials to photograph. This road intersects large masses of bush on both sides. I would also like to add at this point that this road is not straight or level by any means. There's a mixture of turns as well as slight to aggressive inclines and declines along basically the entirety of this road. After driving for 40 minutes without any luck, we decided to head back along the same route we'd taken. We were driving for about 10 to 15 minutes on our way back when we hit one of the very slight gradual inclines along the road. When we were about halfway up the incline, I noticed something in the distance maybe 200 to 250 meters or so, which I initially thought was a shadow being cast from residual lighting of my high beams. All of a sudden, it moved from the middle of the road to the right side. At this point, and while the figure was still in motion, I asked the passenger, and the person who's been present for the last three unexplained experiences, can you see that? To which they replied, yeah, what is that? We got to the top of the incline and onto level ground once again, and stopped in the location that we saw it. I stopped and I pulled out one of my torches and surveyed where we'd seen it. To my surprise, where it had crossed to was a small property which was essentially a house with a very small paddock with horses out in the front. But what caught my attention was that the horses were not startled in the slightest and could actually see one of them close to the fence calmly eating. After about two minutes of surveying the area, I continued along the road and asked my passenger exactly what they had seen. They relayed exactly what I had seen. A tall, six-ish foot but with about two and a half foot wide profile but rounded figure. It was very hard to gauge an exact height because since we were on an incline, the perspective was a little off. For instance, say a person was to walk in that exact spot, we would only be able to see them from the knees up due to the blind spot on the summit. My passenger added another piece of information, which was that it was rusty colored. I couldn't make out a color, but I have to admit that I was not paying as much of attention to it as I was the road. I was going at about 70 kilometers an hour, so I really had to focus on driving while also trying to get to the summit as quickly as possible to see what it was. I would also like to add another detail, which I find is rather strange. While I couldn't see the figure's complete leg area, it didn't seem to be walking in a normal fashion. It's almost like it was gliding across the road. I know that seems odd. If I had to liken the body shape to a known animal, it would definitely, without a doubt, be an orangutan, but standing a fair bit taller and not as hunched in the lower back area. So there you have it. I no longer live in that area. I now live 40 minutes north of there, but I still visit often due to having family there. I would like to point out that all of these incidents happened within about a six week period, which all seemed to start with the hazard reduction back burning. Australian summers are harsh. I've not had any weird happenings since then, and I still spend a ridiculous amount of my time out in the bush. I also work in a scientific field. I work with wildlife, so I know which animals are endemic to Australia, and I know that what I saw is not. My dad told me this story from when he worked in a nursing home in Australia. It spooked me a bit, and I have no idea how he lasted as long as he did in that nursing home. For the record, my family are all skeptics, as far as I know. But I think this is the one story that would persuade me that ghosts are real. My dad worked the night shift, and he said that he had been told stories of deceased residents passing the front desk on the bottom floor. He said he even heard babies crying on the top floor. The nursing home used to be a maternity hospital. This crying would occur even though there was now no maternity clinic near it. 
There was a TV room on the bottom floor. It was on this floor where some of the residents who were kept in bed all night for their own safety were housed. He moved the chairs near the TV all the way back to the wall and locked the door. He came back an hour or so later whilst waiting for the porter and the door was open and one of the chairs was moved back across to the television. The door hadn't been forced. There were no windows in the room and even if there were, the chair was too heavy to be blown back across the room. All the patients were accounted for. The porter arrived and my dad asked him about the occurrence. The porter said, Oh yeah, that's Bob's chair. He doesn't like it to be away from the TV. My dad said, There is no Bob at this nursing home. The porter chuckled and said, There used to be. He's dead now. That's my dad's one and only experience with ghosts. And it chills me to the bone. I have quite a few stories I could tell, but I decided to start with this one because I think it illustrates a few things about me and my now husband. It was also the first time I really saw a ghost right in front of me rather than in my peripheral vision. I think I may be a bit of an empath judging by the experiences that I've had over the last 50 odd years. My husband, Jay, however, is a skeptic. He says he would love to see a ghost, but doesn't expect to. He once took part in a study at a university, one of those classic guess-which-card-I'm-holding-up experiments. This was in the 70s. Jay got so many wrong that it was statistically significant in the negative direction. He says that proves that there's no such thing. I think it indicates the opposite. I believe he actively blocks his own abilities to the point where he negates the paranormal around him. Being around him is like wearing psychic earplugs. It's very soothing. The following occurred in the early 80s when we were at university in northern New South Wales, Australia. Most of the students lived on campus and the university had its own radio station to cater to them. A friend of ours, Gail, was a DJ at the time and had a midnight till dawn weekend shift. She invited us up to the station one night to tape some albums from the station's record collection. The radio station was located in a faculty building about a 20 minute walk from the college where we all lived. Gail had the keys and locked all the doors behind us. The station consisted of two rooms, a large rectangular room housing an office area with two glass walled studio booths partitioned off on one long side and a storage room housing the library. The entrance door was in the long wall opposite Studio A. The door to the library was in the short wall next to Studio B. Other than the library, the entire area is visible from either of the two studios. Gail commenced her shift using Studio B while Jay set up in Studio A with some blank cassette tapes and I headed into the library to pick some albums. The record library was fantastic. Four walls of floor-to-ceiling shelving, packed solid with classic rock LPs. I was standing on a chair, choosing some music from the top shelf, when I started feeling that there was someone, or something, behind me. Almost, but not quite, touching me. I was telling myself not to turn around, that there's nothing there, and so on. But the feeling got so strong that I really wanted to get my back against the wall. I have personal space issues, and the sensation of anything being that close was just too much for me and I had to get out of there. I grabbed a couple of records, took them to Jay, and then I went to talk to Gail in Studio B. From where I was sitting, facing Gail who had her back to the main room, I could see the entire radio station. Jay was in the studio to my right, and the main door was diagonally to my right. The one and only door to the record library was diagonally to my left all clearly visible through the glass walls of the studio booths. I watched Jay get up, leave Studio A, walk across the office space from right to left behind Gale and enter the record library. As he disappeared into the library, a figure in blue came out of the library door, crossed rapidly from left to right behind Gale, 
and entered Studio A. I turned my head to look directly into Studio A, but nobody was there. About 15 minutes later, Jay came out of the record library and walked back to Studio A. Immediately, the blue figure shot out of Studio A, crossed behind Gail, and went back into the library. Gail must have seen my eyes following it, because she said, quite excitedly, You saw it, didn't you? I knew if there really was something here, you would know. It turns out that Gail had been feeling like she wasn't alone up there at night, and having heard some of my experiences, she decided to try an experiment. She kept her experiences to herself, and then waited to see if I picked up anything. Gee, thanks, Gail. It also turns out, I guess, that while Jay ain't afraid of no ghost, the ghosts seem to be afraid of him. This story happened many years ago, around the months of June and July. My family and I often go up and vacation at a cabin in Yungaburra, Cairns, Australia during the winter. We do this as we miss the cold days that we would get from our hometown of Toowoomba during the winter, as Cairns is tropical, so it's summer 24-7. Yungaburra is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that if you blink, you'll miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical, with about 150 or more years of heritage. As usual with rich heritage and small towns, local folk legends from over the years accumulated. One of these legends ended up coming true. We rented this cabin that was on the brink of bushlands, and it was next door to an old farmhouse that has quite a bit of land including some of the bushland the cabin backed onto. To get to the cabin, you had to walk up a somewhat steep dirt road that also leads to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium-sized pond that ran along it. This dirt road came off one of the main streets of Yungaburra. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungaburra. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He, on the other hand, did not have anywhere to drive the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. It got to about 11.30 and I decided that I'd better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15 minute walk, so after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized that not driving was a dumb idea, as it was about five Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper on and that was it. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder and I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway and God did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was very wrong. After I turned my flashlight on, fog started to roll in. At first it was only light fog, but it continued and developed into heavy fog, and then it surpassed heavy fog, and then I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, well, here we fucking go, something's about to happen, get it over and done with. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew that there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom and the last thing I wanted was to fall into it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance, a small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard, Son, is that you? Come here out of the fog, follow the lamp. It was my mom. I couldn't yet see her, so instead I followed the light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up the steps and I heard the door open, so I knew that I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction that I had seen it last. I was calling out for my mom to turn it back on, and there was no reply. 
I finally ran into a wooden guardrail, literally, and some steps. I walked up the steps, and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I wasn't home. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swaying open in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There are three things you do in this type of situation. The three F's, if you will. Flight, fight, freeze. And I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mom's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then that I realized I would rather be out in the fog than standing on the doorstep of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs. I heard the voice now yelling, My son, where are you going? I started to sprint, but as I was running, I smashed my foot and leg against some sort of stone and fell flat onto the ground. It took a chunk out of my knee and I had cuts all along my hands. I still have some scars from it. I turned around and realized that I had not tripped over a stone. Well, not any stone. I had tripped over a tombstone. At this point I screamed, got up and started to run even more. I was screaming for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped. I thought that I got far enough away from the house. Until little amber lights, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and ran for it. Yet again, I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the metal at the end was just my life. Before I knew it, slam, I ran straight into a wall with my head being the contact point. I blacked out, and from what I can remember, I was woken up by my dad who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently, when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night, and any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me some time to rest. This also gave me time to ring up my friend so he could come over, and perhaps give me some insight into what I had experienced and what my dad saw. He and I sat out on the patio. I could see the farmhouse, only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend, according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first ones built, late 19th century, during the 1910s or something. A well-known mother, Anne was her name, had let her son play with some of his mates down on the main stretch of town one day. It started to get late, and as it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then, heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go looking for him. As she walked down, she could hear his footsteps, and she told him to follow the lamp. When she made her way back to the house, she was not accompanied by her son. It wasn't until the next morning that they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He had hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently that of her son's. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late, cold, dark nights, mistaking them for her own lost son. The young Abura fog is one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. I've gotten used to generic things, stuff moving, stuff missing, shadows, all that sort of thing. So I wanted to share something truly unique that happened to me. It was supposed to be a simple hiking trip in the Oregon wilderness, a break from hectic work life. I stumbled upon the cabin purely by chance, a quaint structure seemingly untouched by time, hidden in a dense part of the forest. The first night was peaceful, 
with only the sounds of the forest to keep me company. But when I woke up the next morning, something felt off. The calendar on the wall showed the same date as the day before. I brushed it off as a mistake, until I realized that everything outside was exactly as I had found it the previous day. The same fallen branch on the path, which I had picked up and moved. The same pattern of mist swirling in the trees. As the day progressed, it became clear that I was reliving the same day. When night fell, eerie things started to happen. Shadows danced in the corners of the room, and faint whispers echoed through the cabin, though nobody was there to make them. The next morning it happened again, the same date, the same unchanging scenery. But this time I noticed something new, a hidden compartment in the floorboards containing a diary. The diary belonged to a woman who had lived in the cabin decades ago. Each repeating day, I uncovered more of her story. She wrote about her lover, a soldier who was supposed to return from war. But as days turned into years, his letter stopped, and Emily, the author, was left waiting, her heart growing heavy with uncertainty and sorrow. Nightly, the cabin seemed to replay fragments of her emotions. The whispers seemed to be fragments of her prayers for her lover's return. The shadows were manifestations of her growing despair. On what felt like the tenth repetition of the same night, I found a final entry in the diary that I hadn't seen before. It was written in a shaky hand, the ink blurred by what I assumed were tears. Emily had learned of her lover's death, her hopes shattered. Overcome with grief, she could not bear the weight of living in a world without him. I realized that the cabin was stuck in a time loop, echoing Emily's last days of heartache. That night, I spoke to the cabin, to Emily's lingering spirit. I told her that everything was different now, and that if she was waiting for him, he wouldn't find her here. He would be where she should go the other side, whatever that is. The next morning, I finally awoke to change. The calendar had moved forward one day. The forest seemed different, alive with sounds and movements that had been absent before. And the diary was gone. My husband and I live in Willow Creek, California, in Northern California. Our small town revolves around Bigfoot. Everything here is Bigfoot themed. We even have a cage in case he's ever captured. No joke. Our property is 40 acres and is surrounded by forest service land. We have no neighbors. We've always felt like we've been watched. We barely hear any wildlife and rarely see any despite living in the woods. A couple of separate nights we've had knocking on our bedroom wall and window, and it's freaked us out a bit, but we've since brushed it off. Tonight, though, my husband had to take our quad up to the generator above our house to fill our solar panels with water. It was pitch black, and as soon as he turns out the quad and it turns off, he's loudly screamed at by what he described as a large male human. He did what he had to do, and quickly left. He's convinced that whatever it was was not human, as it's extremely unlikely that we have someone else living in our woods. I'm trying to chalk it up as an animal, but it's getting hard to. Does this sound like Bigfoot behavior, or something else? When I was four years old, I was living in Australia, Gold Coast to be exact. I don't remember much at all about that age, which is pretty normal, but there is this one thing that keeps coming back into my mind to this very day. This wasn't just some nightmare that kids usually have. I was wide awake, 
and I remember I felt everything that happened. I was put to bed by my parents sometime during the night. They left the room, and I was all by myself. I remember trying to fall asleep, but I was suddenly interrupted by some creepy figure. I remember being pulled off my bed and dragged underneath the bed by my arms. I couldn't move at all and I was unable to speak. I remember seeing this very dark figure with bright eyes holding on to me. From that point on, I can't remember what happened. I don't know what that was or how it even happened. I'm pretty sure it was some kind of sleep paralysis. But if you have any idea, let me know. I went on a little hiking trip with my dad to Shasta, California, a small town in Northern California near the Oregon border. Shasta is home to a potentially active volcano named, of course, Mount Shasta. There are many trails on Mount Shasta, so my father and I were excited to do some hiking. We drove up the side of the mountain to the parking lot in which one of the trails begins. I believe it was called the Old Ski Bowl Trail. The landscape was a very barren incline filled with rocks, boulders, dirt, and very few trees. About an hour into the trail, we came across a very odd assembly of these large boulders. They were arranged in a circle. We thought it was strange, but we continued on. If you look up pictures of the trail, you'll see much smaller rocks arranged in patterns and circles. My father and I only encountered three people. At least, that's what they appeared to be at first. The first two were a father and son. We met them on a steep incline that went along the wall of a cliff that would then switch back as it reached the top of the cliff. We stopped and said hello, talked about the trail, and then went along our separate ways. Here's where it gets weird. Dad and I kept walking up the incline for just about two minutes. I turned around and I saw the father and son so far down the trail. It should have taken them at least 20 minutes to get down to where they were but somehow they were there in only two minutes. To this day, I have absolutely no idea how that could have happened. There was no one else on the trail at that point, and I could see the color of their clothing from that distance, so I knew it was them. I pointed it out to my dad. We thought it was weird, but we didn't dwell on it, and we kept going. Here's where it gets so much weirder. As we reached the top of the cliff, there was another strange rock arrangement that was off to the side of the trail. This time, there were far more rocks than before, and they were now arranged in rows, almost like gravestones. We continued on the trail and reached another sort of incline with a switchback to reach the top of yet another cliff. We reached a point where we would need climbing gear to continue, so we decided to head back. When we turned around, I saw a man standing among the rocks, staring at us. He was wearing a button-up shirt, cargo shorts, and a wide-brimmed straw hat. He was at a distance where I should have been able to make out his facial features, but it was almost as if he had none, like his face was just flesh and skin. I pointed him out to my dad, and then the man quickly ducked down behind a boulder and was peering out at us over the top of it. It seemed almost playful, like a child trying to play hide-and-seek. For a few moments, I was out of it, and I have no recollection of what was going on. According to my dad, I just started walking toward this man in the hat. My dad was calling out to me, Joshua, Josh, what are you doing? Where are you going? And then I came to. I was standing right at the edge of a cliff. It was a huge drop, enough to kill me or seriously injure me. My dad grabbed me and pulled me back to the trail. He told me to stay put, and my dad went down to the boulders to search for the man, but he wasn't there. There was nowhere for him to go except up or down the trail. It didn't make any sense. He just disappeared. I have no idea what was going on on that trail, and I have no explanation for it. I have told this story many times to family and friends, and no one else has an explanation either. I've done research and I've found similar stories about encounters with a man with no facial features wearing a hat. 
I've also read that the Native American tribes from the area viewed Mount Shasta as a holy site. They believed that it could act as a portal to another dimension, and that it's guarded by spirits who would potentially harm anybody who tried to go up to the volcano. If anybody has any similar experiences, or any insight at all, I would love to hear. First things first, you should know that I am a skeptic, and I don't believe in things without evidence. I prefer to think rationally, and I'll try to debunk anything before I put too much stock in it. I do, however, have a story that I can't explain. In 2010, I was in my early 20s living in Southern California and working for a computer and phone company with big fancy mall stores. Come on, you probably know the one, right? We nicknamed it the Fruit Stand. Anyway, we'd just come out with a new phone that was in high demand. Part of working in this store was giving a personalized experience to each customer who purchased a product, and helping them get it set up if they so desired. One day, I remember taking a customer for a new phone. The man was very tall and very thin. He had long blonde and gray hair, and very defined features, prominent cheekbones, and a very pronounced chin. I also remember his clothing was very formal. He wore a black suit with a white shirt, not something you would often see in sunny San Diego. The man looked to be somewhere in his late fifties to maybe mid-sixties. His hair was graying and thinning, and he was quite pale. During the transaction, it was clear that money was no issue. He picked up one of every single accessory that I suggested. You always knew rich people from how they dropped cash on expensive products that they didn't need or understand. He happily agreed to the insurance program for the phone and the other membership services that we were selling as well. The normal process to sell a phone requires the customer's driver's license and credit card. To activate the phone on their phone line, we needed to put in their license information and have them give some info to access their account and check for their upgrade. Once I had his driver's license, I discovered a birthday of 1915. This man was 95 years old. At the time, I should have been really surprised, but it was like I didn't even consider it. I think I just politely told him that he looked very good for his age. We finished the transaction, I set him up with everything, and his demeanor was calm and friendly. It wasn't until looking back that I realized how strange it was that he was 95 years old but looked to be so much younger, and also how not shocked I was at the strangeness of the situation at the time. I now joke that I once met a real-life vampire, because that's honestly the closest thing I can identify him with. Pale, not aging, and somehow charming me into not being stunned by his age or the strangeness of the situation. Whatever he was, I do think I was hypnotized to some degree, and that he was not just a 95-year-old human. My Experience at Pine Valley Cabin Let me share this freaky experience I had in a cabin up in Pine Valley, Utah. My buddy Jack and I decided to take a weekend trip for some hiking and fishing. Jack's uncle had this old cabin up there, said we could use it any time. The place was pretty rustic, tucked away in the woods, no Wi-Fi, no cell service. <laughs> exactly what we were looking for. So we get there and the cabin is more off the grid than we expected. It's this old creaky wooden structure surrounded by these tall pine trees. It had a real creepy vibe, but we shrugged it off, excited for the weekend ahead. The first day was great, hiking, fishing, the works. But as night fell, things started to get, well, weird. We were sitting by the fire, telling stories and having a few beers, when we heard this strange noise. It was like a soft tapping coming from the side of the cabin. 
We figured it was probably just an animal or the wind. Later, when we were bunking down, the tapping started again. This time it was followed by what sounded like whispering. It was so faint that I thought I was imagining it. I asked Jack if he had heard it and he just laughed and said I was trying to scare him. I tried to sleep, but the whispering continued, growing louder and then softer. I couldn't make out what was being said. It was like someone was right outside the window. I got up to check, half expecting to see somebody peering in, but there was nothing, just the dark, quiet woods. The next morning we joked about it, blaming the wind or maybe one too many beers, but inside I think we both felt a bit uneasy. I don't know about you, but I've never had so many beers that I hallucinated. We spent the day outdoors trying to shake off the weirdness of the night before. The second night though, was worse. Both of us woke up to the sound of footsteps outside. They were heavy, like someone was pacing back and forth on the porch and was fairly irritated. I remember just feeling frozen, listening to those steps, wondering if we should go out and check. We mustered the courage to look outside, but again, nothing. No footprints, no sign of anyone being there. It was dead quiet, and the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. By morning, we had had enough. There was just something about that cabin, something so unsettling that we just couldn't explain. We packed up and left as soon as the sun came up. On the drive back, we talked about it. Jack admitted that his uncle had mentioned some weird stuff happening at the cabin before, but he never took it too seriously. He thought it was just old family tales and nothing more. I've done some camping and hiking in all kinds of places, but I have never experienced anything like that. There's something about that cabin in Pine Valley. Something, as my grandpa would say, that just don't feel right. This happened in Costa Mesa, California. I was homeless at the time and under immense stress as a result. I've had a dozen or so very strange things happen in my life, but this one was truly upsetting. I was walking my usual route, which was around the campus of the community college that I attended, even still. I had only recently quit my job and moved out of a house I was renting a room in. Admittedly, I am something of an antisocial, misanthropic, generally depressed person that feels the weight of the world seemingly heavier than my peers. But I'm an A student, and I think a troubled life has lent a heavy hand in these detrimental character traits. I'm being verbose only because I think, or hope, there's a certain genuine nature to someone who can see potential red flags in their own recollections. But I would swear to my creator that the following testimony is 100% accurate. So I was walking and approaching a crosswalk. Down the adjacent sidewalk, I see a woman 30 yards away, walking up to a grocery bag on the sidewalk, 10 feet in front of her. She's already carrying two in her hands, one in each. I go to help her as I have nothing to do and she seemed old. As I approached her, this was confirmed. At most, she stood five feet, probably two to three inches shorter. She looked to be about 60 to 70 years old. She was generally unkempt. I asked her if she could use some help. She said with a heavy accent, sure, and indicated her destination was on the other side of the street, where I had planned on crossing anyway. I was handed one of her bags and insisted on taking the other, leaving just the one that she'd been walking up on now at our feet. We start heading to the corner. The bags were heavy enough for me to look inside. It looked to be four mangoes in each bag, but I remember thinking it was easily 10 pounds. We get to the crosswalk and she starts hitting the button super fast, like her feet were on fire. At this point, the bags felt as if they had doubled in weight. We get to the signal and I make it no more than halfway through the intersection and the bags feel every bit 
of 80 to 100 pounds each. I'm 6'1", and I'm in good shape. I could not believe what was happening. I sincerely didn't think I was going to make it. I looked back at her, and she has both hands supporting her bag, taking half strides. She puts on the most disturbing, full tooth smile and said, too heavy? I remember the fear of her face made me turn around more than anything. I made it in one single step to the other side of the street, and I had to drop the bags. I remember the strangest of all was that the plastic handles hadn't been compromised whatsoever. No stretching, nothing. She was click-clacking in half steps, and at this point I was tearing up because I couldn't understand what was happening. She dropped her bag by my two. She looked at me, smiled wide, full teeth again, and said, Too heavy? You stop or keep going. I said, weeping, I'm so sorry. I can't go any farther. Her smile somehow got even bigger, and she said, Okay. I began to sprint back across the street to get away from her. I was ashamed and terrified. I looked back to where she was, and she was now hoisting each bag, one by one, under her chin with both hands, walking at three or four steps, putting it down and then grabbing the next, carrying it three or four steps, over and over. She was walking into a place for the developmentally disabled. It was a community for mentally disabled people in the area. I walked away, weeping as I saw her carry those three bags, now no more than four feet at a time. But I also had no desire to help her anymore. I'm still bewildered and terrified. I don't know what else to add. I know it sounds made up or phony, or like I'm making up for being a terrible person. But I'm telling you, those bags went from holding just a few mangoes each to feeling like they were holding so much more. I don't know how that happened. And it's almost like she knew somehow. I don't know what happened that day, but it did. And if anybody knows how to explain it, please let me know. This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late twenties, and so is my friend. It was around June, in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets coldest in Toowoomba, and that night I remember it reaching negative four degrees Celsius, or about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark is a teacher there, and apparently his car had stopped working. I wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block. I finally reached the block, and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what had happened. He said in a shaky voice, He's here. A ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now, as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak out. Dallin's is a boarding school, so I knew there was a small amount of people still there. However, the boarding block and admin block are far, far apart, and I was not about to wander through the dark pathways with Mark spouting the stuff that he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up the office and cautiously walked out. We were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers. The wind was making an eerie, howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light, an orange light, coming from behind us. All of a sudden it got really warm, and I mean a quick, sudden boost in temperature kind of warm. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see what was at the top of the hill. This still freaks me out when I think about it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us. When we turned around, he stared at us for about five seconds, although it felt more like five hours. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over the side of the path, 
The man on fire ran past us, down the hill, and into the forest. I got up, and I looked down toward the oval. And he was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running toward the road, until both he and the fire vanished. At that point, we decided to run to the boarding block to find another member of the faculty. We reached the block, and we found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told that it was a really common thing to see if you stayed in the admin block too late, or if you were walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, everyone can hear his screams. At least once a week, they say. Apparently he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. The faculty member, who was also a teacher, said that he had only seen the Burning Man once. When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, he said, All the drawers started to open, and I heard a voice say, The fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why, he concluded. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they had ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her thirties. She asked, do you have an appointment, Mark? No, he said. We just wanted to ask if you've ever seen... Then an older lady, maybe in her late sixties or early seventies, came out from the back and said, you two saw the burning man, didn't you? Mark replied, yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came closer and said, Yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many a time. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late, and if you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left, and Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. And just for context, this happened when I was about 9 years old, and I'm 18 now. My mom recently married and moved to California so I was dragged along with her, leaving everything and everybody I knew behind, except my sister. The house we moved into was decently big, having four bedrooms and two stories, and my new stepfather was actually a pretty nice guy. My sister and I got our own separate rooms, which was a plus, despite them being right next to each other. One thing that always haunted me until I was 16 years old was the dark, and I never really understood why. Just the thought that anything could come out of nowhere to jump at me always frightened me, I guess. Anyway, it was a night in April, and my sister had just recently turned 12 years old. We were having a great time on the trampoline that my sister had gotten for her birthday, but since it was getting late, my mom came out and told me it was time for bed. I didn't argue with her, and I went straight to bed. The next thing I remember is waking up with a numb arm in the middle of the night. This was extremely strange for me. I always remember sleeping through the night as a kid, but this one night I woke up for no explained reason. I didn't have the urge to go to the bathroom, I didn't need food or water, nothing that I can think of. But when I woke up, the first thing that I realized was that it was very cold in my room. Like really cold for spring in California and certainly nothing that an air conditioner could produce. I then picked my head up, looked around the room, and I saw this large black figure standing by my door. Being nine years old, I didn't know what to do, so I just pulled the blankets over my head and prayed for whatever this thing was to go away. About five minutes had passed, and I peeked out from under the covers to see the black figure staring at me. I froze, thinking that if I didn't move, then it wouldn't come to hurt me. But after a couple of minutes passed, I finally got the courage to jump out of bed and run across my room into this black figure. When I got to it, it suddenly disappeared, and when I turned the lights on, I couldn't find any traces of something having been there. Obviously still being frightened, 
I thought that being with my sister would help me calm down. So I rushed out of my room and burst through my sister's door to see the same black figure. I grew wide-eyed again and swiftly climbed into my sister's bed to find her gone. My sister wasn't in her room, and I was stuck alone on the bottom floor of my house, not knowing where my sister was, with this black thing stalking me. I started to cry, thinking that this black thing had killed my sister and was now going to kill me, but I somehow fell asleep. I was up the next morning to my sister shaking me, wondering what I was doing in her bed instead of my own. I told her that there was this black figure in my room, and I figured that going to her would make it go away. What she then told me shakes me up to this very day. She told me that she also saw a black figure in the middle of the night, and had gotten so scared that she ran all the way up to my parents' bedroom to sleep with them. The Haunted Outback Station by Outback Packer 93. I've traveled through the Australian Outback several times, but my last journey left me with an experience that still haunts my dreams. It happened near an abandoned sheep station, a place where the sunsets paint the sky in fiery hues and the nights are as dark as pitch. I was on a solo road trip, following a dusty trail that cut through the heart of the Outback. I planned to camp near this old sheep station that I'd heard about from a local in town. They said it was abandoned decades ago, left to the mercy of time and the harsh outback elements. I arrived at the station as the sun began to dip lower, just below the horizon. The place was a crumbling relic, its once busy yards now overtaken by the wild. I set up camp, cooked a simple meal, and settled in for the night. As twilight deepened, I noticed something odd. There was a figure standing near the old water tank, a silhouette barely discernible in the fading light. Thinking it must just be another traveler or a local, I called out a greeting. No response. The figure just stood there, motionless. Curiosity overcame me, and I grabbed my flashlight, heading toward the figure. As I got closer, the air grew inexplicably colder, a chill that seeped into my bones. The figure became clearer. It was a man, dressed in what looked like old-fashioned shepherding garb, his face obscured by the shadow of his hat. I stopped a few meters away, unsure of what to say or do. Then, the figure slowly lifted its head, and I saw its face, or rather, the lack of it. Where features should have been, there was only an empty void, a darkness deeper than the night around us. Fear gripped me, rooting me to the spot. The figure took a step forward, and as it did, it began to fade, becoming more and more translucent until it vanished altogether, leaving nothing but the cold night air and a lingering sense of dread. Obviously, I didn't sleep that night. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential specter. As soon as the first light of dawn broke over the horizon, I packed up and left, not stopping until I reached the bustle of a nearby town. Later, I learned that the station had a tragic past. Decades ago, a young shepherd had vanished while out in the fields. His body was never found, and it was said that his spirit still wandered the outback forever bound to the land he once tended. I've lived in California my whole life. As soon as I had my driver's license, I would save as much as I could so that I could go down to Disneyland at least once a year. It was a lot cheaper to do that back then, and I'm a Disney freak. When this happened, I was almost 22, and I was still living in my first apartment. 
It was in the South Bay area of the Silicon Valley. Earlier in the day, I had driven into the North Central Valley to pick up my best friend at the time. We were going to Disneyland, and this was her first time. She was so ridiculously excited, I didn't even mind the fact that I had to drive three hours north just to go back down south again once I had her in tow. We were finally officially on our way at about 9 p.m. so that we could avoid any traffic. We were going to make a quick stop by Isla Vista, where my partner was staying for school, to catch a nap and pack him up so we could all go together. I always took Highway 101 when I was driving down to Santa Barbara. It took longer than taking the I-5, but honestly, I just preferred it. This trip was no exception. A few hours into the trip, as my friend and I were blasting Disney music to get us in the mood and singing along, we had passed through King City. And that's when I began to see the strange shapes along the side of the road. I didn't think much of it at the time, attributing it to the Tully fog beginning to settle in onto the highway. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, there was a deer carcass right in front of us on the highway. Without enough time to avoid it, and going probably a little bit too fast, we ran right over the thing. Instantly, my car began to reek of decay. Honestly, it was horrific. We pulled over under the nearest street lamp to make sure that there was no damage to my car. We called animal control to report the corpse and pull the putrid deer meat out of my front bumper and grill. Soon enough, and only a little nauseous, we were back on our way. I remember that I had started to feel off right about then, but I thought it was just me being sick from the deer smell. At the time, I didn't even entertain how strange it was that there was a rotten deer carcass in the middle of a busy highway. They're usually prompt about at least moving those things to the side of the road where nobody will hit it. About 20 minutes later, the strange white shapes moving, almost rolling, along the side of the road became much more prevalent. There were zero traces of any fog, and with the smell almost completely gone, the sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach was only getting worse. I knew something was off, but I didn't want to say anything about it because my friend was a little bit of a scaredy cat. Then I saw what looked like a body, wrapped in gauze, roll onto the shoulder from an embankment. But when I looked for it again in the rearview mirror, there was nothing there. I had slowed down considerably at this point, which tipped my friend off that something was wrong. I could feel her nerves rising almost instantly. When I finally pulled my eyes back to the road in front of me, that's when I saw it. And my friend saw it too. On the side of the road, a man was standing beneath one of the sparsely placed street lamps. He was no ordinary man either. He was half as tall as a lamp, making him at least three meters tall. The not-actually-a-man man was wholly unclothed, but lacked any genitalia at all. Almost like an alien. Despite this, I more or less just understood that he was male. He was emaciated to the point of almost being skeletal, but still managed to be standing perfectly straight. His hair was long, wispy, like cobwebs, and his skin looked like white, tanned leather stretched over his bones. As we passed him, the only part of him that moved was his head, to slowly turn and keep watching us. His eyes almost looked like they were made of chrome metal. I kept my eye on him through the rearview mirror, watching him get farther and farther away, until we crested over the hill and were no longer able to see him. In the passenger seat beside me, my friend was sobbing uncontrollably, which to me meant that she had seen him too. Not wanting to stop, all I could do was offer her my hand and floor it. I tried to get to my partner's house as fast as I could. We spent several minutes not saying a word. I wanted to say something, but trying to wrap my brain around what I had just seen left me speechless. At some point, the radio had been switched off, leaving the only sound in the car being my friends sobbing. What happened next all happened more or less in the same moment. Without even a shudder, my friend abruptly stopped crying and almost threw herself at the window control on her door with one hand, frantically trying to buckle her seatbelt with the other. Her belt had been on the whole ride, and she was particular about seatbelt safety. Before she could even reach it, the window was already halfway down, and she was scrambling to keep it from lowering any further. 
She screamed something about not letting it take her, and eventually got the window to roll back up. At the moment I saw her begin to move, I could hear the window was already going down. My hands were nowhere near the window controls on my side of the car. They both had been white-knuckled on the steering wheel since we saw the man, except for when I held her hand. At the moment I heard the window going down, I heard a raspy, biting whisper in my ear that said, I'm going to pull your friend out of that effing window. After hearing the voice, I slammed on my brakes and swerved onto the shoulder. By the time we stopped, the window was up and my friend was sitting back, shock white and wide-eyed in her seat. I was livid. I turned to the seemingly empty back seat, and almost in a growl, I spat out the words, Get the F out of my car. You are not welcome here. I never thought that anything would answer me back, but at that moment, both my friend and I heard it, the same voice that it had whispered in my ear, saying, Fine. That was all it said, before I could feel that something had changed. I floored it again, calling my partner as my friend began to sob once more. I instructed him to do some warding things in his room before hanging up, and desperately tried to build a protective bubble around the car. We still had an hour or so to go before we reached Isla Vista, and honestly, it was one of the longest hours of my life. Eventually, my friend became more lucid, and we talked about what had happened to her. She told me that she didn't know why, but all of a sudden her seatbelt unbuckled, and she just knew something was going to try and pull her out of the window. I told her what I had heard and confirmed that we both heard the response to my demand. We eventually made it to Isla Vista, and decided to pack up with my partner and continue straight down to Orange County. Nothing else happened on the trip down, and we eventually got back to feeling the excitement for Disneyland. We all had an absolute blast, almost completely pushing what happened from our minds. Almost. We took the same route back home as well, and we didn't see a single thing out of place. I've made that drive probably a hundred times between Disney and visiting friends and partners in Southern California, and to this day, that's the one and only experience I've ever had on that drive. Gold Coast Encounter by Lena I've always been a skeptic. Ghost stories and supernatural tales were just that, stories. But my experience on the Gold Coast shook that skepticism to its core. I was vacationing in Surfer's Paradise, drawn by its beautiful beaches and lively atmosphere. I rented a small apartment near the beach, a quaint place that seemed perfect for a relaxing getaway. The first few days were exactly what I expected, sun, surf, and the bustling nightlife. But things changed on the fourth night. I returned to my apartment late after a night out. The place was dark and I was too tired to bother with the lights, so I stumbled into my bed in the dim moonlight. Just as I was about to drift off, I heard a faint whisper. It was so soft that I thought I had imagined it. I brushed it off as the wind or maybe a neighbor, but then it happened again. This time, the whisper was clearer almost like somebody was in the room with me. I sat up, my heart racing, and scanned the dark room for any sign of an intruder. Nothing. Trying to calm my nerves, I got up to get a glass of water. That's when I saw it, a shadowy figure standing in the corner of the room. It was human-shaped, but seemed to be made of darkness, darker than the surrounding shadows. I froze, not sure if I was seeing things or not. The figure didn't move. It just stood there, like it was watching me. I reached for the light switch, my hands trembling. The moment the light flooded the room, the shadow vanished. There was no one there. No way that somebody could have hidden or escaped without me noticing. I didn't sleep much that night and the next day I asked the landlord if there had been any strange occurrences in the apartment. He seemed uneasy, avoiding my gaze. 
He mumbled something about previous tenants complaining about weird happenings, but nothing concrete. The following nights were restless. I would wake up to strange noises, whispers, and once, a chillingly cold breeze that seemed to come from nowhere. Each time I turned on the lights, the room was empty, but the feeling of being watched never left. On my last night, things escalated. I woke up to the sensation of somebody pressing down on my chest. I opened my eyes to the horrifying sight of the shadow figure looming over me. Its form was more defined now, almost like a person cloaked in darkness. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I just lay there, frozen in terror. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished. I was left gasping for air, my heart pounding out of my chest. I turned on every light in the apartment and stayed up until dawn. I cut my vacation short and left the Gold Coast the next day. I couldn't shake the feeling of that shadowy presence, and even now, back in the safety of my own home, I sometimes catch glimpses of something out of the corner of my eye, or hear a whisper in the quiet of the night. Part of me thinks I'm not rid of that shadow, at least not yet. I was out in the garden with a friend when my partner, we'll call him Bob, called our dog. Let's call him Spot. Just his name. Spot started running toward his name and then stopped dead in his tracks. In the same amount of time that it took Spot to hear his name and run a few steps, I thought, Bob is calling Spot. I wonder why. Wait, was that Bob? The last thought coming just as Spot stopped with one front leg grazed mid-step. My friend and I looked at each other, eyebrows raised. Did you just hear that? I asked. Yeah, it was Bob calling Spot, my friend replied, a bit dubious. You see, Bob was about a hundred yards away, last I knew, and his voice seemed to come from closer and to the right of where I thought he was. Feeling something was off, I yelled, Bob, did you call Spot? He responded, what? From where I had thought that he was, and also because he's a bit hard of hearing. Trying to be heard, I yelled, did you call Spot? To which he replied, Spot, thinking that I was asking him to call the dog. Instantly though, Spot takes off running in the direction of actual Bob. My friend and I look at each other with more eyebrow raising and agree that that was really weird. Ten minutes later, when Bob joined us in the garden, I asked him if he had called Spot earlier. He said, yeah, you told me to. I said, no, before that, before I yelled to you. He said no, and he thought it was weird that I was asking him to call Spot. So I told him what happened and clarified everything, and he immediately guessed that it was a raven mimicking him calling our dog. I was a little suspicious assuming that a raven could even sound exactly like him, or at least enough alike to fool myself, my friend, and the dog. Also, we've never heard the ravens talk before. Fast forward three weeks, when I mention this to my friend in a group of people, and how I've never been creeped out at our place before, but that I can't stop thinking about that. He says, me too. Then suddenly remembering, he turned to Bob and said, earlier today, when you walked up the hill, did you call for Nick? Referring to his partner, who was also visiting. Bob said, no, I don't think I've ever called for Nick. My friend then relates a similar story to ours, hearing Bob call for Nick, but not from where he thought Bob should be, feeling doubtful then going to find Nick to see if he'd heard it too, and he hadn't. This happened outside, and we live in a fairly remote place in Northern California, National Forest borders three sides of our property, and we have neighbors to the north of us. None of the neighbors are close enough to hear, and they don't sound like Bob. I looked into Corvids, as we have many, including Ravens and Stellar Jays. The first one could be explained by this. Bob calls Spot often enough that it's not too far-fetched 
that a Corvid could have been mimicking that, although I still doubt it would have sounded exactly like him. The second one is a bit harder for everyone involved to swallow. Bob hasn't said Nick's name very often on our property, mostly just in the last week that they've been visiting, and certainly he's never called to him. I also looked into cryptids. I was told once that the natives believed an entity lived on the mountain that I now live on. I wasn't told much, just that it was neither good nor bad, but that the natives stayed well away from there. Any thoughts on what this might be? This paranormal encounter took place at the hotel that I worked at last year. I was 20 years old, working at a small mom-and-pop hotel in Ontario, California. I had worked there for some time before I started to stay there for a few months. The owner taught me everything I needed to know so that I could run his business while he went on a business trip to Africa. Mind you, I didn't have a car so my only option was to stay there and work around the clock if need be. I didn't have to pay for the room, and I got to wash my clothes in the laundry room. There was a grocery store within walking distance and restaurants all around me where I could get food at a discounted price since I worked at the hotel. I thought this was a pretty sweet deal. One night my boyfriend came down to visit and while he was in the bathroom, I heard banging coming from the room next to ours. Then I heard scratching on my walls. I told him to stop playing around and he didn't even know what I was talking about. The banging continued all night, so I called the front desk and I told them that the people next to me were being loud. I had to be up at six to go down there and work. She was quiet for a while and then she said, we didn't rent out the room next to yours. Mind you, I had an end room. I quickly ran outside to see if the curtains were open or closed, and they were open. I could see right into that room, and nobody was in there. It was an outside hotel. I have never been so creeped out in all my life. Then I decided to sage the room just to rid it of any bad spirits or energy, and that worked, for a while, until it didn't. The next time something demonic happened, I was asleep and kept hearing whispers in my sleep. I hate whispers with a passion, they creep me out to the fullest. So I sat up in bed, and I was looking around the dark room. In the corner of the room, I saw white, glowing eyes staring at me. I felt frozen by its glare. I could see its body, and saw that it was crouched down, holding its knees. Then I saw more shadows appearing closer and closer. I reached to turn on the lamp next to the bed, and it didn't turn on. My next thought was that I needed to run outside and get to safety. It took all the balls in the world for me to get up and run out there. I was so scared I couldn't even feel my legs. All I could feel was the cold wooden floor beneath me. I got to the door and flung it open only to see that the bedroom curtains were on the outside of my room's window. The sky was black and the clouds were dark, dark green with gray tints. I was mortified to realize that I was still asleep and I hadn't actually woken up. I looked back inside the hotel room and I saw myself asleep in the bed. I screamed bloody murder and that's when I jolted awake for real. I said a prayer and went back to sleep. The encounter that followed was much worse. I went back to sleep and yet again I could hear things. I was scared and I couldn't move any part of my body. I started to pray in my head as loud as I could, only to awake and feel my body slam onto the bed as if I had been levitating. I called my grandma the next day and she said that it was probably a demonic attack. I got my car shortly after, just a few days later, and I never stayed in that hotel again. I was severely depressed at the time I was staying there, and maybe those spirits were feeding off of that, but I never stayed there again.
I grew up in Saugus, California, on Copper Hill. I've had several paranormal experiences while living there. I've had things thrown at me. I've seen full-body apparitions. I had a milk carton crushed in front of me and had an unplugged vacuum cleaner turn on. My parents, whom I live with, had their own experiences as well, such as seeing an entity or just having a general unease in the house. I guess I'm just reaching out to those who may know the area because this stupid house haunts my dreams to this day, and it's been 18 years since I lived there. I told a story before here, expressing my concerns for a house that I lived in 18 years ago. I wanted validation that maybe the area itself was haunted, and I wasn't the only one being tormented. Turns out a lot more people responded than I initially thought would. Some wanted a more detailed account of the happenings within the abode, so here we go. Let me start off by stating that there were numerous occurrences. So many that I'm only going to share the big ones. Some smaller events were hearing my mother's voice when she wasn't home, general unease throughout the entirety of the house, and my younger brother's room seeming to be in a permafrost even when it was over a hundred outside. His electronic toys would go off on their own as well. I would hear, I am the dark knight, in the middle of the night on some occasions, from his talking Batman toy. That part was kind of hilarious looking back on it now. Just for quick info, I was between the ages of 6 and 12 when I experienced all this madness, and I am now 30. The first occasion I want to talk about is a shadow that I encountered. It was probably around 7 in the morning. I was eating breakfast at the dining table before school. I had made myself a bowl of cereal and left the milk out on the counter of our kitchen. From the dining table, I had a clear view of our entire kitchen. As I was eating, I started to feel that nasty unease that I so often felt. I looked up from my bowl and into the kitchen, and I stared in horror as I saw a black mist enter the kitchen and move toward the counter where the milk carton was. As the mist started to dissipate, the milk carton on the counter was crushed, the cap flying off, and what remained of the milk exploding everywhere. My father, who was a very abusive and angry man, walked into the kitchen and started screaming at me for making the mess. I just stared at the table. I didn't even try to defend myself. What was I supposed to say? A shadow crushed it? The second experience I'll elaborate on is being tormented in my room. There was one night in particular where I stayed up late, as I often did. I was a fearful child. I was staring at my bedroom door. I could sense that unease, and I tried my best to make myself comfortable. As I continued to stare at the door, I felt my blankets tug toward the lower corner of my bed. As I sat up in terror, the corner of my comforter lifted and started shaking violently, as if my blankets were going to be ripped off. I was so mortified that I went to scream, but nothing came out. I've never experienced that before or after. It brings even more fear because you can't call out for anyone in that state. Finally, I did manage to yell for my parents with a raspy voice. They came into my room as the shaking stopped, and searched it to make sure that there weren't any intruders or that our cat wasn't scaring me. They found nothing. On other occasions, I've had my rocks from my rock tumbler thrown at me as I ran out of my room, and I've seen small shadows darting in and out of mine and my brother's rooms. The last incident that I'll mention was probably one of the last experiences that I had before moving. I was about 12, and I had just gotten home from school. I was a latchkey kid. I went straight for my back living room. I had two living areas, as a lot of houses in the area had at the time. Maybe they still do. I don't know. I plopped down on the couch and turned on my television. There was a vacuum sitting next to the TV. My puppy joined me. Suddenly I got that weird feeling again. I tried my best to ignore it, but... My puppy started whimpering and ran to the back door that led to the backyard. 
I called to her, desperately trying to deny that anything was going to happen. She progressively got louder in her cries and started scratching at the back door, something that she had never done. I stood up to go get her, and as I did, I saw a mist form next to the vacuum. I thought maybe it was just dust, puffing up from the bag, and I walked toward it to investigate. As I got closer, the vacuum suddenly turned on, startling me. It turned off within a few seconds, and I thought, maybe it was a power surge. I investigated further, only to discover that the cord wasn't even plugged in. Needless to say, I grabbed my puppy and stayed at my neighbor's house until my parents got home from work. I don't know if anybody who lives in Saugus can tell me what happened. I don't know if the land is haunted or if it was just the house. Either way, it haunts me to this very day. Something in the Outback by Roger L. I've never been one to believe in the supernatural, but what I experienced during my trip to the Australian Outback changed everything. It started as a typical adventure. I was camping in a remote area, miles away from the nearest town. The first few nights were peaceful, filled with stargazing and the sounds of nature. But on the fourth night, things took a bizarre turn. I was awakened by an eerie, pulsating light outside my tent. Initially, I thought it was someone with a flashlight, but the light was too bright, and it seemed to hover in midair. Cautiously, I unzipped my tent and peered out. What I saw was inexplicable. A luminous orb-like object was floating a few feet off the ground. It wasn't any drone or aircraft I was familiar with. The orb was emitting a soft humming sound, and its light pulsated rhythmically, casting strange shadows on the ground. Frozen in fear and curiosity, I watched as the orb began to move. It glided effortlessly over the terrain, pulsing occasionally as if it were surveying the area. My mind raced with questions. Was this some kind of unexplained natural phenomenon, or something more otherworldly? The orb then started to approach my tent. As it got closer, I felt a strange sensation, like a static charge in the air. My skin tingled and the hair on my arms stood on end. I didn't know whether to run or stay put. Suddenly, the orb stopped, hovering just a few feet away from me. I could see its surface now. It seemed to be made of some translucent material, and within it, I could discern faint, swirling patterns of light. And then, as quickly as it appeared, the orb shot up into the sky and vanished into the night. I stood there, in the silence of the outback, completely baffled by what I had just witnessed. The rest of the night was uneventful, but I couldn't sleep. My mind was filled with questions. What was that orb? Why did it come here? Why was I the only one who had seen it? In the morning, I packed up my gear and headed to the nearest town. I inquired with locals about what I had seen, but nobody seemed to have any explanation. To this day, all I have is questions, and an experience that I will likely never forget. The Yowie, by Indignant Sloth 023. For years, I had heard stories of the Yowie, Australia's version of Bigfoot, but I'd always dismissed them as folklore. That changed during a camping trip in the dense eucalyptus forests of New South Wales. I was exploring a remote area, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. The forest was dense, the air filled with the scent of eucalyptus. It was the perfect escape from city life, or so I thought. On the second night, 
something unusual happened. I was sitting by the campfire, the only source of light in the pitch black forest. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes, too heavy to be a small animal. I initially thought that it might be a kangaroo or a lost hiker, but then the rustling grew louder, closer. Curious and a bit unnerved, I grabbed my flashlight and shone it toward the noise. The light caught something, or someone, standing at the edge of the trees. It was tall, easily over two meters, and covered in thick, dark fur. For a moment, I froze, trying to process what I was seeing. The creature was humanoid, but not human. Its eyes reflected the light from my flashlight, giving them a ghostly glow. It stood there, watching me, its chest rising and falling with deep, slow breaths. Then, as suddenly as it appeared, the creature turned and vanished into the forest. The underbrush shook violently as it retreated, leaving behind a heavy silence. I didn't sleep that night, and at first light I packed up and left. Along the way, I saw large, unusual footprints near my campsite, deeper and larger than any human could make. Later, I did some research, and I found the tales of the Yaoi, how it's apparently been seen for generations in these forests. Most locals just take it as a mystery that was better left alone. And I decided that maybe they were right. The Great Ocean Road by Macy L. It was during my time as a backpacker in Australia when I stumbled upon something I still can't quite explain. I had been traveling along the Great Ocean Road, soaking in the breathtaking views and the sense of freedom. One evening, I decided to camp near the Twelve Apostles, those magnificent rock formations that rise majestically from the Southern Ocean. I set up my tent on a secluded patch of land, away from the usual tourist spots. The night was clear, and the stars were particularly bright, adding to the sense of serenity of the place. However, as I settled into my tent, an uneasy feeling crept over me. It was a sensation that I couldn't shake off, a sense of being watched. Around midnight, I heard a strange noise outside my tent. It wasn't an animal. It was a soft, rhythmic tapping, like someone gently knocking on a door. I thought it might be another traveler, perhaps lost or in need of help, so I unzipped my tent to look out. What I saw was baffling. There was a figure standing near the edge of the cliff, silhouetted against the moonlit sky. It was tall and slender, and seemed to be looking out at the sea. I called out, asking if they needed help, but the figure didn't respond. It just stood there, eerily still. Curiosity overcame my initial apprehension, and I decided to approach. As I got closer, the figure turned toward me. That's when I realized this was no ordinary person. Its features were indistinct, almost like a shadow but with a faint luminosity that seemed to be from somewhere else. I stopped in my tracks, my heart pounding. The figure didn't seem threatening, but its presence alone was intimidating. It then raised what seemed like an arm and pointed out toward the sea before turning back and vanishing into thin air. I was left standing there with my mind racing. I looked toward where it had pointed but I saw nothing unusual. The sea was calm, and the Twelve Apostles stood silently in the distance. I didn't sleep much that night. In the morning, I asked around in the nearest town, but nobody had heard of anything like what I had described. Some locals did share tales of ghostly sightings and strange occurrences along the coast, but nothing matched my experience, and to this day, 
I don't know how to explain it. 